Good morning, everyone. I hope you had a good night's sleep last night. Welcome to the third day of the IEC 2023. So we kick off today's plenary program with the plenary titled Emerging Technologies on Natural Disaster Detection, Turkey, Syria Earthquake and Remote Sensing Application. The plenary will examine the role of space technology notably Earth observation, in addressing the recent earthquake that deeply impacted Turkey and Syria. Leading this panel is Odzan Kara, senior researcher, propulsion and space at the Technology Innovation Institute. Please, let's give him a warm welcome on stage.
So, good morning, everybody. Today we are all together at the Haider Aliyev Center, the most valuable symbols of Azerbaijan. The slogan of this center, to the future with values, is based on over overcoming obstacles to moving towards a goal with leadership, wisdom, and transparency using innovation. So this center also includes a concert hall, library that is magical because we all are inspired with the wisdom of knowledge that we are doing as a space pioneers. We always dance with the nature, so we want to explore nature in all aspects. However, the most natural disasters are the long-term results of our actions as we dance with the nature. We use many technologies when examining the disaster and trying to take precautions. And these technologies mostly emerge from the space exploration. If you remember the two powerful earthquakes hit parts of the Turkey and no northern Syria within the space of 12 hours, destroying hundreds of buildings, claiming more than 8,000 8, people have been rescued over the to 12 different provinces, the United Nations, World Health Organization, and many other international actors helped millions of people to, to, to most devastating uh, earthquake in Turkey's modern history, as well as the Syrians across the border in the Northwest. So disaster management authority in the Turkey identified precautions due to the magnitude, intensity, local geology, and many other aspects in planning used in constructions. And images taken from the Earth observation satellites were significant to, to identify all these data for us. After the earthquake, the electricity was cut off for a while. Uh, there was no access to cities. And th these were difficult times due to the cold weather conditions. That's why space technology supported us a lot during this uh, disaster. So I personally supported the earthquake in various aspects. And it was a situation that affected in my life and changed my life perspective. And people were united only to help the, the people who, uh, who were in the emergency zone. And all the museums, stadiums were changed to collect the you know, packages to send to the field and to support the people. I also personally helped people in the field as well as the packaging in this, the, the big stadiums and the museums. So as, as someone who is active in the space field, I thought we should talk this topic uh, and in, at the IAC 2023 here in Baku. So that's why, first of all, I would like to thank both the selection committee, IAF secretariat, and especially Alessandra and Constance helped a lot during this uh, communication, and also the Azar Cosmos to, to, to support this panel. So today we have very distinguished panelists among us. They kindly accepted my offer to be in the stage and inspire all of us in this critical topic using space technologies to support the natural disaster. So first, I would like to introduce Rene Grispa from Planet Labs. He is the sales representative in the Central Europe and Commonwealth of Independent States countries. Rene has long-term experience in consulting the companies in the space uh, applications and he also supported the disaster response in Ankara. Please applaud Rene. The second panelist, Ms. Tarja Stefanova, founder of CEO of Irmo Company, which is ESA supported company, uh, and he, by using her startup, he supports the small satellite technologies tracking greenhouse gas emissions. And please welcome Daria. We have the, the most significant space influencer and uh, space marketing person, Remco Timmermans, with his own agency called SpaceSight EU. He supported us a lot, especially as a member of European Association of Remote Sensing Companies. Remco is ambassador for the use of Earth observation data 
for applications on, on Earth. <laughs> Last but not least, Mr. Luca De Loro has more than 15 years of experience in the United Nations, especially he is the chief of disaster risk management and the climate resilience sections of UNOSAT, United Nations Satellite Center. Luca. So thank you so much, everyone, being here. And I would like to remind you, we will use Slido application. You can check these two small screens. Please download Slido application. And at the end of the panel, we will uh, accept your questions for the panelists. Thank you so much. So um, I would like to start with Rene. Rene, I, we met up before the panel, and you shared your experience that you visited Ankara after, after the earthquake. So could you please share your uh, actions in Ankara and how was the situation when you arrived there? Yeah, hello. Good morning, everyone. So um, when the terrible news reached us that an earthquake hit uh, Turkey um, uh, on the 5th of February, um, our emergency response team, so we have a collection planning team, immediately started to collect imagery uh, with the help of our high resolution satellites. Uh, because we know in such situation uh, having fresh up-to-date in information is the, is the key for any decision making and uh, when we came into the office as I say we decided uh, okay when an earthquake of that magnitude was was that impact to the people itself let's go there and uh, help the people in place in place means I have not been in the disaster area itself we have been in Ankara uh, helping the Ministry of Interior and uh, Afak, the um, emergency response team uh, in giving them access to uh, our imagery. And uh, there was a whole team of planets uh, behind us working uh, in the premises in order to task the satellites uh, to get images on request. Uh, wherever the team had a need for fresh information, we uh, tasked the satellite to, to get them the next day or next morning a uh, fresh image. <clears throat> in, in order to help them take the right uh, decisions, make it faster, the uh, response, and, and get help to the people as much uh, as early as possible. Yeah, that's, that's totally amazing because just after the earthquake, all international actors try to help the, you know, uh, people by using uh, uh, technology, space technology. And did, did you face any challenge during this process? Or uh, what can you see about to improve the things uh, on, the, on the location uh, to, to making these image processes? Because I will also make a transition about technology because after uh, talking with these challenges, the, what are the most important technologies we can use to 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 reduce the um, uh, to redu to reduce the processing time or support the image processing to to contribute to early warning systems? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. Of course, time is critical, especially in such disaster uh, situations. And whenever you can speed up processes in uh, extracting information from the imagery, it's most welcome. So we <coughs> have. Uh, made all the um, efforts to reduce the time to provide the images from means from taking downloading um, pre-processing and uh, providing it to the imagery but nevertheless it, it takes a few hours so uh, it's a process we, we cannot really speed up uh, things but where we can do a lot more is in the processing and the extraction of information from that so we applied uh, a number of processing changes to extract uh, or to distinguish buildings from damaged, non-damaged buildings, um, to find houses which were not known to and, um, and people on the ground means every house may have potential casualties in it. And so there's a um, machine learning process which detects automatically all pixels covered or which covering housings. And uh, this information was all provided to uh, the emergency response team. Uh, we gave them access to the imagery, their own new imagery, set them up as users on our platform, on the planet platform, so they get uh, immediately access uh, to not only imagery, but also to pre-processed results, analytic results of the imagery. Yeah, that, that's really thrilling to hear uh, the, these actions from you. Thank you for enlightening us, Rene. Thank you. Um, Daria, so you are here to as a vo voice of young professionals, so you have a startup supported by uh, European Space Agency. And how do you envision leveraging a remote sensing application in the wake of natural disasters such as Turkey-Syria uh, um, earthquake? Can you share your experience? 
Yeah. Uh, good morning, first of all, and thank you for the invitation to the panel. It's really great to be here. Second, the earthquake is uh, the earthquake that happened in Turkey, Syria, uh, early this year. Once again, showed that we do not have systems in place to detect and predict such disasters early enough. Uh, and we, as a space community, indeed need uh, obliged to to think what, how, and how, how and what we can contribute for. Uh, to build the detection systems. Um, satellites and Earth observation technology gives a beautiful opportunity to map certain areas around the globe with a, on repeated basis, depending on the number of satellites, of course. We can change the, the latency and the period where we observe the areas. And if we set certain markers in the certain um, areas in the Earth where disasters are very likely to happen, we can make, we can learn about how the terrain is behaving and make certain conclusions and try to predict them. Um, here I will step, uh, step back a little bit and share, first of all, what we're doing at ERMO. We're building um, payloads, which is micro LiDAR combined with shortwave spectrometer to deliver information about greenhouse gas emissions. And even though our first application is to support oil and gas companies to measure their emissions, um, we indirectly touch the, the application of monitoring emissions and accidents in the area of oil and gas. Talking about evolution of our payloads and how we can use microlider for emergency and disaster monitoring, um, Altimetry is a very, very interesting technology that can support us with, with uh, using cameras and visual spectrum. So fusing these two data sets together can help us learn how terrain behaves. And in that way, we can possibly understand like, what's, what's going to happen in the, in the future. Plus, like, after the disaster has already occurred, micro LiDAR and measuring the height of the terrain can also support in assessing what's, what's, the, what's the damage and how to, yeah, how to access certain areas quicker. Yeah. yeah, that's perfect to understand all the technologies and innovative approaches from Daria and Rene. So I will just switch to the topic uh, asking Daria to uh, international collaborations. And you are in a startup and space agency supported. So how do you perceive the potential collaborations between the startups and agencies, space agencies, to support the governments during these uh, the, the emergency responses or, or natural disaster? Yeah, that's a very good question, and indeed we, we should find as many ways as possible uh, in between governments and small uh, SMEs and startups uh, how to work together. The first and very obvious uh, example is uh, yeah, like in any kind of support that uh, governments and agencies uh, can, can dedicates to startups. This gives a lot of credibility in what startups are doing, already pushing uh, small companies uh, towards uh, expanding and towards getting, getting credibility to work with other, other, other companies. Uh, and what startups can do in return, yeah, quickly adjust. Uh, startups are quite agile and, and quick in um, adjusting to new use cases and in case something, something is really critical, it quickly uh, and leanly align to, to the needs. Here, here is another angle where like, the, the collaboration can go together. Yeah, thank you so much, Daria. Thank you. What you do is both motivation and excitement for the all young professionals. And um, so, after technology and international collaboration, so if we use the emerging technologies uh, like a puzzle pieces, it's important to establish a strong building blocks. So a building infrastructure comes from the transparent communication, which is really important for all experts and all actors in the space. In parallel, uh, Remco, uh, you, you follow almost all the space activities, and you are in touch with all the space actors. And you are actually the middle of the communication to, to create a transparency. And what does space community need to do to establish these building blocks in the, in the field? So what gaps you see personally based on your experiences, uh, such as technology, policy, or the collaboration uh, that we can transfer to the uh, natural disasters? Yeah, thank you for that question, Ozan. And, and you use the word puzzle pieces. This is a massive puzzle. Uh, and this is a puzzle that needs to be solved 
very, very quickly after a disaster has, has arisen. And unfortunately, there are still many gaps, but we are working very hard in the industry to bridge those gaps. One of the key gaps is that we talk a lot about space data. And space data is not what these rescue relief teams uh, and authorities need. They need actionable information. And the step to take space data, combine it with in-situ data, combine the different sources of data, we talk about optical imagery, we talk about SAR data, we talk about in-situ, to bring that all together into actionable information that is readily usable by rescue relief teams on the ground, be it ambulance services, uh, the military if needed, uh, fire brigades, um, all sorts of rescue teams that need information to uh, win time. So that is, that is a major gap. Uh, then another gap, another set of puzzle pieces is the many different actors that we have. We have uh, uh, public uh, data sources, Copernicus being a, a big one in the European Union. We have private players, like we have here on stage, um, that all provide different uh, sorts of information that need to be combined, and all these actors need to work together. Now, luckily, we have systems in place. Uh, Copernicus, EMS, Emergency Management Services, is a good example. UNOSAT is a good example. Uh, UN SPIDER, the Disasters Charter. There's several initiatives to bring these um, building blocks together um, very quickly. But the most important gap that I still see is an awareness gap. And that's where I play a role as a communicator. An awareness gap with authorities, with these rescue relief teams, about the fact that space data is available and is there to help. Are we there yet? No. I think we see a big development at the moment, especially in the area of turning data into actionable information. Um, artificial intelligence is going to help a lot, and, and I'm sure that uh, my colleagues here from, from, from Planet and, and Ari as well, and you as well, uh, are, are all too aware of, uh, of, the, of these gaps and the possible solutions uh, that we have. Yeah, you, you are totally correct about, you know, we, we, we need to improve this communication between the agencies, uh, industry and, uh, and uh, uh, all the space actors. And new technologies we will discuss in the second round, such as artificial intelligence or new approaches from the companies. It will be really amazing for us. So, when you first uh, checked the news about the earthquake, what was the first reaction that, that the in the space sector, we have this missing gap, and if we improve this technology, we can use in this Turkey earthquake. What was the first reaction on the, uh, in your mind during this situation? Yeah, the first reaction, well, of course, it's a human reaction. Yeah. It's like yourself. It's every time this happens and we read about the loss of life and the loss of property and the loss of infrastructure, that is always a blow. And with uh, climate change, these things unfortunately happen uh, more often and more frequently. So the first reaction is always a human one, but the professional reaction in a way is then to see how quickly we can activate these, uh, these systems, how quickly can we activate the Copernicus EMS, the UNOSAT, the, the Disasters Charter, etc., and how quickly can we get the information to these teams. And uh, you say, can this technology be used to prevent disaster? Well, preventing is probably one step too far. Of course, space technology cannot prevent earthquakes. That is, uh, that is unrealistic. Can we monitor and minimize the loss of life and damage? Well, we're getting there. I'm not saying uh, we are there. But can we support disaster relief efforts and emergency crews? Yes, absolutely. It's just a matter of time, literally. Uh, the time for the information to get to the relief teams need to be, uh, needs to be minimized. And again, uh, the rest of the discussion that we'll have later will, uh, will tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, yeah definitely. So we, 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 we take the technology from the uh, international uh, space actors and combine with the importance of the com communication with, with Remco. And now, uh, uh, Luca, actually, you are actually one of the people here who are in the middle of the, the, the commercial sector, space agencies, and the all space actors from, from United Nations. So, because, because in times of natural disasters and global event, you represent the, the, the important uh, institution comes to everyone's mind first in the world. So, can you explain what was the role of UNESAT uh, during the situation of Turkey? What was the, your first uh, action and role 
in this situation. Sure, thank you very much. Um, as the chief of the disaster risk management and dis um, disaster risk management and climate resilience section, I did uh, the emergency mapping service, which is uh, a 24-7 operational service that uh, provides uh, satellite image analysis and satellite derived product following major disaster events, complex emergencies, and uh, crisis situations. Um, I, was, um, I was not deployed uh, in, in Turkey because then uh, our service basically provides uh, uh, image analysis support from remote, from our, uh, from our offices in, uh, in Bangkok and uh, in Geneva. And of course, a few hours after the, the earthquake, we've been activated by uh, the first earthquake, the 7.8 magnitude earthquake. Uh, we've been activated by IFRC, by the International Federation of Red Cross, and by the United Nations Office of Coordination of um, Humanitarian Affairs. Um, and then, of course, in Turkey, the, the, the coordination of response was mainly led by AFAD, the National Disaster Management Authority, but um, in, in, in Syria, the situation was much more complex, I would say, much more uh, challenging because of uh, um, lack of uh, national capacity to uh, coordinate response, lack of coordination, and especially there was a, a big challenge with the humanitarian access. So uh, in Syria, we remember that, uh, that uh, there were 12 years of conflict, uh, and uh, uh, right before the earthquake, there were like 15 million people in needs of already in needs of humanitarian assistance and uh, 7 million internally displaced people. So we've been asked, UNOSAT has been asked to, since the earthquake, of course, no, doesn't see any barriers. We've been asking mainly to focus on, uh, on Syria to estimate the level of damage, especially because of the lack of information in this area. So how much uh, time does it take to do, do you access to zone? By you know, some time. How much time does it take? Like, do you do you access the zone in a few min uh, days, or uh, by you know, some time to go to the Ankara to to support Ankara? No, how, how was the, as, as I mentioned, you know, process, that, uh, yeah. we, we that is also the uh, you know the beauty of of uh, remote sensing and uh, uh, space technology that we can see things from. Uh, uh, from uh, from uh, remote, uh, so basically, once we collected the images, we were able to uh, assess areas that were hard to be reached. So we did the, all our analysis was done by our offices in Bangkok. So we've been I, I, no no one from you know so they've been deployed, but we were in uh, uh, absolutely in um, in coordination, in close coordination with uh, the United Nations country teams in the field that were actually giving us uh, what are where the priority area of interest for analysis and uh, what were the operational requirements of um, humanitarian actors in the field. Okay, yeah, really thank you to understand the uh, role of the UN in this uh, situation because you, you are in the middle of all the communications. And um, so now we are in the phase of going to the a bit deep on the technology side. So Rene, I want to turn it to you again. Um, specifically, what technologies such as AI or software implementation you use in the image processing? Or what do you need to be improved uh, technically to act faster, such as early warning system? I read some reports from your side, and you are collaborating with different institutions such as Microsoft. So can you a little bit explain about your process? Yeah, it's, it's of course a, a very complex question. So um, yeah. applying AI to imagery is, I think it's a great future technology and we are at the very, very beginning of, of that uh, development. Uh, but especially with regard to the imagery in, uh, for the earthquake um, response, um, we have been in close cooperation with Microsoft and they have a project AI for good. Uh, means where they use their own computing capacities and the intelligence they have in, in uh, house to apply that to imagery and uh, to extract, uh, for, in, for instance, in, in this case, a layer of uh, building damage and non-damage. Yeah, it means to give a uh, hint for the rescue troops on the, on the ground where to uh, focus their, their uh, activities to. And this uh, technology was actually developed for other crises in, in Ukraine, but then could be easily adapted to a natural disaster case like uh, for Turkey. <coughs> and, uh, 
uh, again, you mentioned that the capacity in in house or in in the country are limited, and the more sophisticated products we can provide to them uh, on top of the visual analysis, it helps in taking the right decisions. And, and uh, yes, Planet uh, having a daily data set for the entire world, uh, so we have a very good documentation of the situation before the earthquake or the day before, and uh, also for the days after. And uh, we have all the means to do a comparison between uh, or a change detection. So what has changed during the, the earthquake? And uh, based on this change detection, um, the rescue troops on the ground may uh, focus on the one or the other area. And um, yeah, I have to say, I heard a lot of uh, accusations and blaming that the government of Turkey is not doing uh, or the disaster response is too slow. I cannot confirm that at all. I mean, it is a huge disaster area, and uh, the people on the ground were really, really engaged and working around the clock in, uh, in getting their head into the situation and finding out where to, where to go first and, and what to do. But uh, what the roads are accessible, also in AI technology, uh, see what roads, um, uh, roads are still available, um, what's the situation on airports, uh, on bridges, and, and so on. These are all logistic information which you need to collect first before you can send in uh, the rescue troops and, and so on. And it, it takes time. Unfortunately, it takes time. Um, and I, I can tell you, so with the help of artificial intelligence, we, we really try to bring that time gap, or means the delay or latency, uh, down to hours or so instead of days, um, but currently it's still needed. And it's one of our focus research things together with partners like Microsoft uh, to apply new technologies to a data source like imagery, which has a lot of information um, content, and to extract the needed information and provide it in a human readable form uh, for the people who need to take decisions. Yeah. yeah, of course, all the brainstorming we have here, it's uh, uh, Take, it will take us the one step further to to impact on the technology and the collaboration. So, Daria, um, by by the support of the ESA in your company, what new technologies or specific innovations you can have uh, based on uh, experience? And uh, can you have some suggestions to to new entrepreneurs to to be active in this field? Thank you. Um, yeah, supporting the last uh, last reply. Yeah, indeed, AI has just a landscape of applications and topped up with different sensors and fusing different data sources. There are just too, really many applications and really many new things we can do. Um, on top of that, uh, brain and processing on the satellite uh, can de definitely expand the volumes of the data we can uh, extract uh, information from. So these are very, very promising drivers or th that can really give us much more understanding um, that we can extract from your yeah, observation data. And answering the second question, suggestion I can give to uh, young generation is to take ownership, take responsibility, be open to challenges and yeah, try out different tasks. Um, that's first one. And second one is mix technologies, try to Try to look for creative, innovative solutions on the edge between different technologies. Yeah, this will definitely yeah, help us in, a, in such an important application such as disaster monitoring. Yeah, definitely. All the interdisciplinary approach, as Daria mentioned, is really significant in the space industry. You can be a mechanical engineer, but your approach in the software or, or can, can, can support the image processing and so on. So it is really significant. So for the round two, Remco, so you uh, mentioned before all your uh, insights about the topic. And as a, as a space industry communicator, what is the role of space media to support the space industry in developing applications for disaster management? Yeah, well, thank you. Um, I basically answered that question in, in the first round because the biggest gap that I see is an awareness gap. And the media plays an important role in helping fill that awareness gap um, simply by publishing about it. The power of storytelling. And there are millions of stories during these disasters uh, that are sometimes very sad, but sometimes also very hopeful in the way that, in our example, uh, space can help these relief efforts. And uh, I think these stories need to be told better. UNOSAT does great work, just to 
pick on you as an example, does great work, but not, not many people know about this. Not enough people know about this um, in, um, in governments, let alone in the general public. UNOSAT is, 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 is not very well known. And that's the same for Copernicus EMS, that's the same for, uh, for UN Spider. All these examples are not very well published. So using the power of storytelling, something that journalists and uh, communicators do, uh, will help there um, simply by publishing about it. Help create awareness with authorities, with the general public that these um, facilities, that, these, um, uh, that this infrastructure exists. And then another thing that is used more and more, this is something really new, is uh, data that is uh, provided on the ground. We now use social media, all of us use social media, and during these disasters we see people posting about what's happening to their lives, to their family, to their specific situation on the ground, posting pictures on social media, assuming that the, the communication infrastructure stays uh, more or less intact. And we see efforts in investigative journalism, this is, uh, is the case in war situations, uh, but also in disasters, where this information, geotagged information from social media, is then combined with information from space, from the air, from uh, ground sensors, providing a whole new layer of, of information, uh, sort of a citizen journalist um, um, data source, if you like. Um, one other thing that I'd like to highlight is, is what Daria just said. Um, when I talk about Earth observation and about space applications, this is an area of big opportunities for people to continue to work on. To use these tools also that, that you mentioned, Rene, to uh, bring this knowledge about AI, knowledge from outside of space, data management, and bring space into that equation and help us develop smarter, better, faster applications to help in these relief efforts. So I would really like to repeat what Daria says, a call to all uh, young aspiring entrepreneurs out there who want to help people with the latest uh, tech available, these opportunities are there. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Your highlights are really amazing to, to, to follow this panel. So Luca, um, uh, during these experience, and you also experienced the other natural disasters such as we had the Morocco and Libya, the flooding and the earthquakes, the, because natural disasters are always here. So in your perspective, the, what are the challenges and limitations encar encountered in providing support through the satellite imagine imaginary analysis in the events such as these, uh, these disasters? So what do you need from the other players in the space as you and you, you, you know that? Well, um... <laughs> It's a great question. There is, I, will, I will answer this question there. First, you know, there are many, of course, one of the major challenge, the limitation is, uh, I would say that, uh, is coordination. It's coordination amongst the, you know, the different, you know, actors involved in, um, in, um, in response in, um, in after disaster event, because we have a multitude, you know, we have many different actors, you know, and, and many different decision making process has to be done, have to be done, you know, in, uh, in that situation. So. One is the lack of coordination between the, I would say, the, the space data providers or those providing satellite derived product because there are a lot of overlapping sometimes. Um, and then there is lack of coordination and then in a way that uh, how, you know, this information is being used, you know, within, in the field to, um, you know, make smarter or more efficient decisions. Uh, then, of course, there are, there are other limitations, I would say, related to, you know, especially in Syria, or if you are now maybe discussing more on the earthquake in the Turkey and Syria earthquake, you know, of course, uh, we have now access to, you know, very high resolution imagery. Uh, you know, technology is not any longer an issue. Uh, we have now uh, lots of uh, sensors, a lot of constellations. We have uh, plenty of data that uh, can be used and exploited, you know, in, for many different applications, including. So, Technology is not an issue. The issue is uh, how this technology, you know, is really informing and being used by those, by governments and those, you know, that have to, you know, take decisions, let's say, and, and do planning. So basically the other, the other issues that I would mention here is that, of course, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, when there was a spread, you know, widespread damage, we need to do damage assessment, understand what is the level of damage, density of damage, 
Uh, and then, you know, you might, of course, accessing pre and post disaster image, very high resolution image, you can assess whether a building, you know, is damaged or not. Now, if you get up available, you know, if it was available, of course, you know, building footprints, you know, before, you know, the, the, the earthquake, we can do much more analysis, sector analysis, understand, you know, uh, for example, health facilities. How many health facilities has been damaged? Uh, or residential buildings. So if we get, you know, and then those, you know, let's say baseline data set are often uh, missing or lacking or not completed to be used to provide more insight, uh, not only for response, but also for reconstruction, which is really needed. You know, this is, a, I would say that uh, it's one of the, and then, you know, of course, be aware about this technology. And so that is, the, you know, it's maybe something that uh, we might discuss a bit later, but uh, I, I believe that, you know, we have, I would mention these three, you know, as a main aspect that uh, might be addressed and then, you know, they were, might be, well, it might be reflected a bit more. But technology yeah. is not an issue <laughs> any longer <laughs> today. Yeah, thank you so much. And your, your aspects really create an awareness uh, in this topic for all of us. So I think uh, we can follow with the questions in your side. And before finishing the panel, I will ask the panelists the last uh, words. But first of all, you can use the Slido application and you can state your questions there. If you cannot use Slido, I believe we have uh, two microphones here. Our colleagues will help. Just shake your hand. Uh, our colleagues will help you. I will start with the first question in Slido. So from Ms. Adele, are there any possible warning signs of a preparing earthquake which can be trusted and monitored from space. So maybe Rene or Daria, you can uh, give a word uh, on that. Yeah, unfortunately there's no secure technology or so which can really predict an earthquake. It would be great if, if we have been a possibility to, to see signs of an upcoming earthquake before, even if it's only hours before, so it would, would help. But unfortunately not, not yet. So there's no technology in, space, uh, in place which can do that. Uh, the only thing are um, monitoring stations on the ground, uh, seismic stations and so on, which may have a kind of predictive in information. And there are a few ideas uh, how to use space uh, uh, for it, especially in, <clears throat> I heard it after the Morocco earthquake recently, so there are some signs that in the atmosphere you some predictions or some pre-signs are available, but it's, it's in a kind of a hypothesis at the moment that needs to be checked. If so, we would be so happy that we have a, a tool where space data can be used to predict earthquakes. That would be really great. Yeah. Anyone wants that? Luca? Or, okay. I can add. Uh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, support. Support that there are uh, different, although there are different hypotheses on how certain technologies can uh, assess is just, yeah, they're not in place yet and um, yeah, there's just not enough, eno not enough data. We have certain hypotheses how to use uh, LIDAR technology to assess the altitude and change in altitude, but yeah, our data sets are quite limited to make the strong statement here and yeah, this, this, uh, this is a hypothesis we, which we're gonna um, test once we launch the satellite, but yeah, indeed there's no reliable space-based uh, system yet. Thank you so much. So there is one quick question regard, related to this first one. Uh, you can maybe quickly add that the, the delivery time of the image from the satellite to the, to the ground station or the, to make the anal analytics. So is there any uh, possibility to change that or uh, specifically uh, what AI tools can be used on that? Maybe Rene again. And that's a very good question. And, and yes, we have the possibility to decrease the time significantly. Uh, but there are two aspects of them. One is the technological aspect um, that we need to download the data from the satellite and make them available to uh, the end user. And uh, we are currently in preparation of a new constellation of satellites which have a direct downlink. Means um, the image will be taken and in minutes from that uh, using geostational telecommunication satellites downlink to Earth and made available in about 20 minutes or so to the end user. That will be a, a big step forward. But the second aspect is um, 
we need to know where to deliver the imagery to. So usually you have an, an administrative process, uh, even the International Charter for uh, Emergency Response and so on. It's a bureaucratic thing. And uh, in fact, the case in, in Turkey showed that and the second day when we arrived, and there were only two images available at that time. And uh, it, it's not blaming somebody that it takes longer, but there is a process uh, behind that ESA has to task uh, different satellite providers. They will take the imagery and ESA will collect it and, and so the Copernicus emergency uh, response system provided to the uh, troops on the ground. Um, it, it takes time. And uh, that's why we, actually that was the reason why we decided to go there and give them direct access not via the emergency response service of Copernicus, which we anyway deliver the data to, but give them direct access to our archives and that data can be used immediately when they appear in, uh, in the database. Yeah, and that actually, I came a question in my mind. We have an earthquake and we have also flooding, water management, the forest fires. We have plenty of the disaster we all face every day. Which uh, situation you are most uh, in challenge? In, in these applications? So, um, we mentioned already, it's a, one challenge is the weather condition. So, if, if you have an optical satellite, it's, it's always difficult to image through clouds. Uh, in case of wildfires, um, you have the additional um, uh, visibility problems at night and uh, with um, um, on fires. Um, but, then, the more satellites we have and, and the more flexible we are in the acquisition time, you know, usually you're around the midday and so the more imagery we have, the more information sources we have for, for making a decision. And I think that's the way forward. So to step away a bit from only sun synchronous orbits, uh, but using satellites in inclined orbits so they have uh, different imaging times over the course of a day in the morning and the afternoon, so five, six, seven times per day. So to get always an updated image about the disaster situation on, on the ground. Yeah, you are, you are totally right. The, the daytime or the night shift is really significant and when we see the natural disaster, we need to be there immediately. So that's why all these talk here will create an impact on that. So uh, I would like to ask, do you also have any questions from audiences? You can shake your hand and there is one from here, uh, Miss Stacy, I see Stacy here. Hi, I'm Stacy or Anastasia, and I have a question. So if Dasha has a satellite, then ESA receives the imagery. How does Remco get the information? Because so far, I have not heard of a source which is going to tell the people about what's going on. So where do journalists and communicators take information in case they need to tell something to the journal public? It's a bit difficult to hear your question here uh, on stage. It echoes a little bit, but I think I, I, I got the gist of it, um, is how quickly do, is this information passed to journalists? Is that what you're saying? Or say it without microphone. Let me give the short answer, and then perhaps my colleagues can give a slightly longer answer. Uh, yeah. um, I don't think it is important that the information gets to journalists very fast. I think it is important to get the information to the disaster relief teams first, and then journalists will develop stories based on that. Um, but it's critically important that the information gets to, uh, well, I suppose to you, Luca, uh, as soon as possible. If I had Yes, if I understood um, you know, correctly, the answer is also the question about you know, satellite, you know, we can access now uh, many different sensors, many different mi missions that are launched by different countries, different governments, so satellite acquire information everywhere. You know, so it's not a matter of uh, uh, which satellite and where, but it's a matter of you know, analyzing this information and sharing this information for, for with, uh, with those that need you know, then depending on the application, there are commercial applications that are for businesses, but then talking about uh, humanitarian, um, humanitarian assistance, of course, this information has to go to the right people at the right moment. It's vital that the information, you know, comes quickly to those that have uh, 
to uh, you know, take uh, very, very um, <clears throat> quick decisions. Uh, so hours, uh, days are in a, in a major response context extremely important to save life and to make sure that people are, you know, put in a safe conditions. And then, you know, the, the, the one something in very, very important also to say that was mentioned by colleagues here is that uh, it's not the data itself important, but it's how this data are analyzed. It's basically what people need, not the data, accessing satellite data, but it's accessing, you know, they derive information from those, and this information is extremely important to be. And then is, uh, and then and maybe we may need to have also to emphasize to be more the importance of communication and making sure that people understand and uh, knows how to, you know, uh, make the right use of this information. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. And we have a question from Mr. Bernard. And after Bernard, uh, there is a gentleman here, uh, the in front. He will ask later on. Please, yeah, Bernard. So, uh, Bernard Frank, uh, former ISA, and um, also now we have a platform uh, to train entrepreneurs and researchers. So I would like to follow on Daria's uh, proposal. I want to advertise that, okay, you can do some work at the level of satellites, but data, but also services, how you use data. And you have many ways to use your creativity for that. One example, we had a company that developed, it's called uh, Blackshaw, Cerberus, uh, that developed a game for people to find features on Mars. Okay, and then he went through the ESA big system and they created a company to apply these games to disasters. And so they invite the public to identify after disaster what roads are still available and then this you can be communicated to the authorities. Now, even further, they have worked with the AI uh, universities to teach the machine to do what the crowd can do. So you can use your creativity, use the new tools of machine learning to develop also solutions. So I think I would uh, uh, invite all of you, if you like games, if you like data, or if you like uh, hardware, there is really a lot of things that you could do as a startup of services. Well, thank you, Bernard. That's, uh, that's a very important call that I think Daria mentioned, that I mentioned, and uh, that can't be said enough. So uh, thank you very much for your remark. Yeah. Thank you, Bernard, with your experience and so on. Thank you. So please, yeah. the gentleman. Good morning. Uh, just to have one, uh, uh, I want to know what is the happened during the Libyan flood. It's, uh, anybody can make the comment. It's a failure of communication, it's a failure of uh, any observations by satellites, or it's a failure of response. So it's uh, because we have the very good satellites for flood monitoring, like Sentinel and other uh, synthetic capture radar. But it's, it's used, uh, looks to be his failure. Just I want to know it's a technology failure or it's communication mm. failure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Maybe Luca, Maybe you can comment on that. I can answer in, in, in this way from what I'm, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, we've been activated for, for, um, um, for Libya floods uh, by um, the United Nations Office for Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. So basically, our emergency mapping service, as I mentioned earlier, works upon a request. So as soon as something happened, we might be requested or not, or activated or not, uh, because maybe certain countries, they have uh, absolute response capacity, they have uh, their own uh, capacity in doing any type of satellite image analysis, so there is no need to have any either international humanitarian assistance or to have an inter or, uh, any satellite image analysis support. C case of uh, uh, Libya floods, UNOSAT uh, was actually the first organization and we, we look into, we, we, as soon as we've been activated, there was an availability of imagery. Uh, we'll, and then we were able to um, uh, basically delineate, you know, the area affected and then, you know, estimate the number of buildings affected. But then, you know, this is a work done um, in the response, so as soon as something already happened. So what you're talking about is basically all the entire monitoring and then, you know, let's say early action is what we call, it's very important now that well, in, now there are many initiatives towards this, what we call uh, anticipatory action, so, and also early warning, but this is, is something that has to see with disaster preparedness as full responsibility of the government that are, that are, and then that is one of probably the major issues is basically how we can 
uh, really you know, increase the capacity and ensure technological transfer to those governments in order that they can handle and they can face this disaster event. So international community can only observe, but then you know, in Libya there was not the situation because of the political situation, of course, there was no any kind of monitoring system in place. Yeah, thank you so much. I hope this information and insight helped a lot. Yeah, please go ahead, gentlemen. Hi, thank you very much, firstly. Uh, Obad El Shehadeh from Turkey. Uh, my question is talking about the problem, which is uh, maybe the communication or other problems. How could the countries that doesn't have a satellite uh, benefits from the data, or how can we communicate this or deliver this uh, information to these governments or to these uh, Zaire risk management teams in that country uh, mm -hmm. because they don't, as we know, that they don't have uh, satellites. How we can deliver, I mean, what is the protocol that they use or now that been, has used by uh, the teams or by the teams who is working on satellites and, and data? Yes. How this communication yeah. that becomes? Yeah, yeah, the thank you. That it's a great question. How the mechanism works to deliver images to countries who doesn't have the satellite and who doesn't have these potential? Maybe Rene and Luca, you can support us. Yeah, I'm happy to answer that uh, question. Uh, of course, there are many countries in, in the world who doesn't have satellite capacities and they have to rely on, on existing satellites from other countries. So um, happily, we have organizations like the International Charter, where the, the image providers, every, I think every image provider, uh, obliged themselves to provide imagery uh, in, for humanitarian aid. So and that's just a process that the International Charter needs to be uh, activated and then people start or the, the companies start to delivering data into it. And that brings me back to my previous statement that uh, it costs time. And so there is a process in place, uh, but it's, it's always a, a bit of delay. Uh, the, the other aspect here is uh, that most of the satellites, especially the very high resolution satellites, which are so important when in these cases of 50 and 30 meter uh, centimeter resolution, are in private hand. So, and uh, as a private company, you always have these questions. So, um, actually, you have to do business and you have to do humanitarian response, and uh, that's an, a question to be decided in every in every company uh, separately. So, we at Planet, we have the policy: whenever something happens, uh, any commercial things step away means there's a highest priority in tasking, so the tasking system itself uh, will always task first uh, satellite imaging process uh, over uh, disaster areas. And um, the, the second aspect is, uh, of course, we have contracts to fulfill and, and so on, and we ask our customers also to step, step back, means wait, can you, can you please wait for two or three days to, to get your ordered image uh, in order to um, uh, fulfill the requirements for a disaster case? And I can tell you, 99% of the customers agree to it. So everybody is in, in the same phase and say, yes, of course, uh, we can wait. And um, we are happy to uh, do from our side, from the internal processes as, as a satellite image provider, to speed up this process by having a collection planning team which is available around the clock, uh, which are scanning and getting the news if something happened and uh, they start, we call it speculative tasking, means it, they probably know that these images will be required and, and we task the satellites to go over that area and get images as soon as possible. And that brought us into the position, especially for the Syria and Turkey uh, earthquake, that we had already imagery uh, available on the second day and could provide uh, to uh, the people on the ground. Yeah, anyone wants that? Okay. Uh, so maybe I can add a bit on the, what Renan said that is the, uh, that it's not important whether somebody has a satellite or not. Uh, as I mentioned also earlier, it's important that um, you know, this, uh, uh, we, we, you know, sat, the, United, the United Nations Satellite Center, you know, we only you know, use and get access to commercial satellite um, send, I mean, we, uh, images. So anybody can buy or can get access to these images, except, you know, for example, in the case of major disaster events, the Im imagery, you know, there is this uh, International Space Charter. Um, the International Space Charter is um, basically an agreement between uh, uh, 17 space agencies that in case of major disaster events, they uh, made all the uh, imagery acquired in a, in, a, in, a, in a disaster situation available only for uh, authorized users, that including UNOSAT and other, you know, satellite mapping groups, of course. 
uh, what uh, the, 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 and again, it's a very important that, uh, that um, you know, imagery, the access to raw image is not, you know, probably important for governments. They might not have the capacity and the time to spend on, uh, you know, doing satellite imagery because they are, you know, agencies or uh, mapping groups that can do the analysis for them. But they have to receive, you know, what are important to, the, to disseminate and to share is the information the right inf the information that has to be provided to the right people at the right time and then uh, that is uh, it's uh, it's very important that uh, that uh, so that uh, to be clarified i guess yeah thank you go ahead Rampo. thank you yeah one short remark in line with your question but also in line with with your question is that the distribution of activations and i did I did some research into copernicus ems so i cannot speak for unisat but the distribution of activations of the Copernicus EMS uh, um, mapping, uh, rapid mapping system is not, equally, is, is not equal. We see a very big emphasis on, on the developed side of the world, European uh, disasters mainly. And this to me, because Copernicus EMS works globally, any authority can activate this rapid mapping system. Um, but that doesn't happen, and that to me is an indication of the awareness gap. So it doesn't really matter whether a country has uh, capacity in space themselves or not, because well, satellites uh, orbit the entire globe, but it's the awareness of authorities in African countries, in Southeast Asian countries, in Latin American countries, that is simply less than it is in Europe. So um, again, this is a communication thing, uh, and that is the role of my community, I suppose, to, uh, again, tell the stories, uh, making sure that uh, these stories are told also outside of Europe. Copernicus is a European Commission-initiated uh, system, but is available everywhere, and that should be known everywhere. And that is uh, something that's not happening right now. Yeah, thank you so much, Remco. And regarding all the questions, actually, I want to add just two quick uh, remarks that International Disaster Charter we haven't mentioned the uh, action of the International Disaster Charter, but the member of, members of this charter, uh, such as CNES, Canadian Space Agency, and many other institutions all around the world provide support all the emerging countries. And also the one important thing is the education. Uh, while I was preparing this panel, I checked uh, some databases that NASA has an education tool called RSET. It is a tool that you can uh, have a free webinars uh, by using the remote sensing applications of NASA. So these are important uh, aspects you can follow. Uh, I think we have uh, time for one last question. Please go ahead. Uh. Hi, uh, Hatice Mübar Ragül by uh, T3 Foundation from Turkey. Uh, in Turkey, when the Turkey earthquake uh, happened, uh, the government reduced the bandwidth to um, prevent false information, fake news. Uh, what else can be done to uh, prevent, the, uh, prevent these kind of false informations? Uh, like, what can be the uh, solution for this uh, from the media aspect? Okay, I think the question is the during these disaster the bandwidth uh, reduced, right? And uh, what how can what can be done to yeah, to improve yeah. these bandwidth uh, situations and so or on? Or instead of uh, uh, reducing the bandwidth mm -hmm. to, to make the, the better uh, data flow. Yeah. So we can maybe finalize the final remarks and answer your question. Rene, what can we done uh, to improve this data flow during this emergency? And you can uh, add quickly and we can ask the all panelists the final words to, uh, to finalize the panel. Uh, yeah, the quick answer here is uh, to use as, as many as possible information sources and combine them. Um, and uh, make sure that the information reaches the right people on, on the ground means in the disaster area to uh, that they have a tool for, for right decision making. Mm. Please, uh, Rania, final follow, remarks. <laughs> following up and yeah, develop technologies that enable the to process in feature extraction faster and in more optimized way. Mr. Remko? Yeah, real quick to answer your question, space can help in places where bandwidth disappears because of disasters. We see Starlink, OneWeb, telecommunications uh, solutions from space can help there. Um, and my closing remark, again, is all about awareness. So let's keep talking about this. Let's keep sharing the stories about how space helps uh, and make sure that as many people as possible know.
Yeah. Also, maybe if I can run my last, uh, <laughs> last words. Uh, remark is really, you know, as I mentioned earlier, and then believe me that I've been in this business for uh, 15 years, and then, you know, this, uh, the space industry uh, made, um, you know, tremendous uh, progress. Uh, I remember years ago there was always, you know, question about, you know, we need more data, data. Now there's no longer need of more data. <laughs> we have all the technology we need. And then, you know, in a, talking about my business and then, you know, what I'm doing, but in disaster situation, especially when major disaster, you know, uh, occur, we need really to uh, bring to the basic, to provide the right information in the right moment because this can really save life. And then, you know, technology. It's uh, if we have what all what we need, we just need to really to mainstream and then make sure that communication and then that uh, you know increase the capacity and then you know provide invest in uh, disaster preparedness is still really the priority and ensuring the proper you know technological transfer to those uh, you know countries that are prone and then you know probably more vulnerable to, you know, disasters and climate change. That is probably is what we know that as the UN, you know, we are trying to achieve with capacity development. Yeah, thank you so much. So with that, I would like to thank all of the panelists to being here to support us with their valuable insights and experiences. I would like to thank you for this interactive panel, asking the questions and listening us. Please do enjoy the rest of the IAC Meet the people, share your imagination, and please don't hesitate to communicate uh, each other. As the Remco mentioned, we should communicate with transparency to support our future. Thank you so much.
Ashraf Rahat from the King Fahad University in Saudi Arabia, and I'm going to introduce the cloud seeding uh, chip.
Dear guests, thank you for being out with us today. For the first GNF, GNF session of the day, we offer you a session organized by the new established Saudi Space Agency. This panel is called Science on SSA HSF1 Mission and is exploring the experiments and impact. This panel will include scientists, astronauts directly involved in this mission to discuss experiments from the perspectives of the primary investigations, astronauts' executions, and student outreach. But I would like now to give a warm welcome to Dr. Barata Munsami, the Deputy CEO of OSSA and moderator of this session. Thank you very much. Okay, good morning, everyone. And it's indeed a pleasure to be here and moderate this uh, global networking. And as indicated, the uh, topic is on the Saudi Space Agency Human Space Flight One mission. I think we'll be digging deeper into the uh, experiments that were conducted and what impact that has had. Uh, just a few fun facts before we uh, kick off. Um, something you might not know. Um, the first Arab astronaut or space, uh, Arab in space, is uh, Prince Sultan Bill uh, Salman. And that happened on the NASA Discovery Shuttle on June uh, 17, 1985. Uh, so that was a while back. Uh, we also had the first two Arab astronauts on the International Space Station at the same time earlier this year. And we have uh, Astro Ali with us. Unfortunately, uh, Astro... Astro uh, Rayana is actually in Japan doing an outreach uh, mission. And talking about Astro Rayana, she's also the first Arab female astronaut to the ISS. Um, so those three groundbreaking uh, facts. Uh, before I kick off, uh, unfortunately, one of our principal investigators uh, on the experiments, uh, particularly on cloud seeding experiments, was not able to make it today. Uh, so we just want to roll a video in terms of uh, his contribution uh, before we kick off. I'm Ashraf Farahad from the King Fahad University in Saudi Arabia. And I'm going to use the cloud seeding uh, chamber experiment uh, that was launched to the International Space Station by the uh, Saudi Space Agency uh, last May. Um, this experiment is a collaboration between the King Fahad University uh, in Saudi Arabia, the Saudi Space Agency, NANORAC, United States. And the experiment was conducted by two Saudi astronauts, uh, Ali El Gurni and uh, Rihanna uh, Bernawi. As you know, that the uh, cloud seeding that we do on Earth is just the uh, spraying of uh, silver iodide salt in the atmosphere to increase the condensation of the um, uh, water vapor and to increase the chances for uh, precipitation. 
Uh, so the idea of our experiment is we do the same thing but under the microgravity conditions. And uh, this is the experiment that was designed um, by us and launched uh, through the ISS last May. So as you can see, we have here four uh, chambers. We have uh, two control chambers and two experimental or test chambers. In the control chambers, uh, we do not uh, spray the uh, silver iodide, so there's no condensation is supposed to happen here. And the experimental chamber, we uh, spray the silver iodide, so uh, we observe uh, some uh, condensation. And now you can see the experiment has uh, some uh, cameras and uh, a water chamber to introduce the water vapor into uh, the chamber. The uh, cameras also will uh, spot the condensation on the uh, on the uh, experimental chamber. Uh, we use some kind of glass, which is called the uh, SOMO glass, that is um, transparent and it also does not allow the uh, water vapor to condense on the glass, but it condenses on the salt. Uh, the experiment has been launched and we have some interesting results that we will be sharing with the scientific community uh, very soon as we have observed um, that the cloud seeding could happen under the microgravity the conditions. So this is just some a nutshell of our experiment and we will share more results with the scientific community uh, very, very soon. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you. Um, we also have a video that we collated of the kind of, just give you a sense of the, the mission itself, uh, end to end. So can we play that video as well? It's about two minutes, I think. هي أهم ميزة بالنسبة لدى السعودية هي الطاقة الشبابية اللي فيها وميزة جيدة إنهم شباب واعي قوي لديه طموح رائع مثقف متعلم بشكل جيد مبدع لديه قيم عالية باقي فقط نضع الرؤية ونعمل عليها تحت بيرق عزنا لمن دعانا يبشر بعزه ولا عنهن تثنى لا صدح صوت الوطن جاوب صدانا نزل الزن وعادها دندل وغنى تحت بيرق عزنا لا من دعانا السلام عليكم من الفضاء شكرا سيدي خاتم الحربين الشريفين الملك سلمان بن عبد العزيز صاحب الرؤية can see it was a very successful mission but also a very proud one for Saudi Arabia uh, and for the, the world as well. I'm going to start off with uh, Dr. Badr Shira. Um, he's from the Nebula Research and Development Company and his main focus was on, uh, he conducted six experiments primarily on the nervous system. So uh, Dr. Shira, can you describe the experiments that you conducted uh, on this mission? and explain why you chose them and then also look at you know some of the results and how that contributes to our understanding uh, thank you so much for uh, your introduction and it's really my honor and pleasure to be here with you today uh, so uh, the experiments we conducted uh, involved examining the brain a nervous system in space in a way that was never done before uh, using novel tools and 
looking at the brain from the big structure level up to the molecular level. Uh, so uh, the experiments involve looking at the brain structure and blood flow using functional near-infrared spectroscopy, which is a device sent for the first time to space. Uh, another experiment involved looking at the brain electrical activity using portable EEG system that is flown for the first time to space. Uh, also, we sent another novel tool, which is the automated pupillometer, that is examining the pupils of the eye and providing the characteristics of pupillary light reflux in, the, uh, in microgravity, and it's also flown for the first time. And we correlated that with a well-known methodology used for in space for a long time, which is the optic nerve uh, ultrasound. Uh, we also examined the biomarkers obtained from uh, uh, that is uh, looked at in biological samples obtained from astronauts. Uh, the experiments involved collecting uh, data and samples before flight, so to look at, to have a baseline before exposure to microgravity, and then the second part is done in microgravity to see the effects of uh, space flight and effect of microgravity and radiation. And the third part is done post-flight to document recovery and return to baseline. Uh, so this is an overview of the experiments. Uh, now, these experiments uh, actually provide novel data and novel information about uh, the effects of space travel on the human brain, which is essential uh, if humans want to survive on the moon, Mars, and beyond. And it's essential for human, long-term human presence in space. Uh, so these experiments are, uh, you know, novel and unique in that aspect. The results are uh, still under uh, processing, but from the preliminary result, I can tell you that all devices are showing important data that is provided for the first time to the world. And once we publish this data, that will be a scientific contribution on which future research is built upon. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I'm then going to turn to two of my panelists, um, Dr. Khalid Abu Khabar uh, from the King Faisal Specialist Hospital, um, and then uh, co-investigator Dr. Wijdan Al Hamadi uh, immediately after that. Uh, but Dr. Khabar, um, as a principal investigator, so what is the model and scope of research that w you used and that was to perform this particular mission? You, so your focus was mainly around the cell science experiments, and you had about four of those experiments on board. So, yeah. Uh, okay, well, first, thank you very much uh, for uh, inviting me here. Uh, so, the model is very interesting because we spent months just thinking about what would be the model. And uh, I remember that, uh, you know, this all the space uh, agency were kind of impatient with me because I took long, because I keep changing it. I think it's very important to think about the model because it's not like the lab, you're going to come back and forth, you know, and then you can repeat things. No, this is <laughs> very far away. You cannot just do things as you would do in the grounds. So uh, it's leukemic blood cells. We send it over there, leukemic blood cells. We, I call it a disease in a dish because it's really a reflection of inflammation response, cancer, uh, and as a matter of fact, as general uh, response to basically any stimulus that you would find. This is from our own uh, uh, program that, that we originated in Riyadh. Uh, we knew so much about this, this uh, platform. Uh, and we're looking at the effects of microgravity, obviously, and overall the ISS uh, environment, and, and how these leukemic monocytes behave in response to uh, stimulus. The stimulus itself is interesting. It's actually a microbial product. We, we, we obviously, we cannot send the microbes because we don't want to infect uh, uh, Ali and Ryan and the other. So we send an inert microbial uh, product. It's a part, actually, of, uh, of E. coli, actually a part of the cell wall, uh, sorry, the, uh, the, the membrane of um, of, of E. coli, which is a bacteria, a common bacteria. It should induce inflammation, but interestingly, at the same time, they should also induce growth factors that play exactly the same roles in cancer. So we're going to understand both. So this is actually the model. Uh, and the experiments, um, they say there are four experiments, but actually there are more than four experiments. 
Uh, we're looking at the time response and how it is different from the ground, uh, com sorry, compared to the ground. Uh, we're looking at, uh, uh, for the first time, we're looking at actually, uh, or actually measured, we measured the mRNA half-life. This means how the RNA is, is existing and, and, uh, and living in, in a way in space. Uh, and then um, in the same model, we're actually looking to response to therapy because obviously we want to know what would happen in future in, in human health about the response to therapy. Is it going to be improved or is it not going to be improved? And if it's improved, you know what you're going to, it can be very helpful. If not, you have to have ways of mitigating them. All this from cells, simply cells, monocytic cell lines. We can, we can understand. Now remember this is a discovery stage. It is, doesn't mean that tomorrow you're going to apply it to humans. No, it, this is just a step towards understanding and, 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 and designing uh, the future experiments, if you like, especially in the longer flights, because that's where, where, where things are. I don't want to really take too much, because I think we're then going to talk about uh, the difficult part that she went through. Okay, which is the integration and, uh, and validation. Thank you. Before I doctor, uh, jump to Dr. Wichdan, so just to give a sense to the audience, there were a set of experiments being done, one on microgravity, and there was a reference one done by Dr. Wichdan on the ground. So what was your role as a principal investigator? Okay, the role of the principal investigator would be um, really, I mean, uh, overall expression and uh, sorry overall I, I say expression because I use I use gene expression all the time with my experiments it's actually the overall supervision from the concept to the end most importantly also the analysis and the post analysis which is actually being carried right now and as a matter of fact I received the first data just about week two weeks ago at 11 o'clock at night and then I just I could have just simply waited until we then look at it next morning and, and the other, uh, uh, you know, and the other uh, colleagues in, in the teams who look at it, but no. Actually at 11 o'clock, I start analyzing them until two o'clock in, in, the, in, in the morning and, and it tells you how much excitement there is there. And I can see already from my own point of view, at least from my own experience, there are changes already happening. At that, at that level of the molecular cell level. So you can see the principal investigator role is a nervous role. <laughs> so I, I, have, I have to be in almost every step, uh, you know, and, and, and deal with, uh, with all these aspects. No, th thank you for that. And Dr. Wichdan, you were the co-investigator. Can you maybe elaborate on your role and any challenges you, you faced on the ground? Uh, well, of course, there was so many challenges during uh, this mission, I mean, like preparing for the project. First of all, I worked closely with Dr. Khalid. Dr. Khalid, he was my teacher and my mentor for the past 20 years. We worked together in so many projects and we had lots of publications together. So when we first received the call for uh, a proposal for to be done in the space, uh, we sat together, we created a plan, we divided the roles. Uh, Dr. Khalid uh, had an idea, so he told me these are the, we had four ideas, so these are the ideas. Uh, can you write an experimental plan that can cover them? So I was so excited in a way that I wrote 13 experimental plan proposal. And then we showed it to Axiom and uh, Saudi Space uh, Agency, and we had to select four experiments out of these 13. Uh, the simplest experiment because uh, the other ones were uh, a bit more complicated. Um, so uh, yeah, that was my role. Uh, so we planned the experiment. We, um, we did the first uh, experiments back in Riyadh just to make sure that this experiment is working well or everything is uh, like we know that it worked. And uh, then I had to go to, uh, to the state to implement the experiment, to convert it to a, a platform that adapt to the microgravity. So the challenges, of course, there was a lot, because studying inflammation at different time points in microgravity, you have to uh, consider the astronaut time, the equipments which were available in the International Space Station, um, uh, we had to do lots of modification. Uh, so, yeah. 
So, but thank God it went well. Okay, no, thank you, uh, Dr. Wisdom. Uh, I'm going to turn attention to Astro Ali. Um, so it was your hands and uh, Astro Rihanna actually conducting the experiment. So maybe walk us through in terms of what is your role, personally experiences or challenges that you faced, and what is the kind of the training involved uh, so you can prepare yourself for these experiments. All right, thank you, Dr. Bell, and I would like to thank everybody here for your uh, participation. Uh, well, uh, Ryan and I, we trained uh, for about 10 months for this mission. <clears throat> we worked closely with the PIs uh, to make sure we understand the experiment and how we are going to uh, implement the training we had and work with the tools uh, that are uh, aboard uh, the International Space Station. Uh, the training itself was uh, uh, very interesting because we had to train in different parts. Uh, first, uh, firstly, uh, training on the space vehicle itself and how to live inside Dragon uh, when we are orbiting free flight space until we reach the International Space Station and how to learn what to do inside it and how to mitigate any emergency or situation that could happen, God forbid, in. and also training on the International Space Station, which is a bigger vehicle orbiting uh, the Earth, uh, and, and also uh, learning the equipment are inside it and the, uh, the hardware and software that we're going to be interacting uh, with. And also very, very critical part of the training is focusing on teamwork and time management and how you're going to uh, manage your time uh, between experiment and doing other outreach events and also working hand to hand uh, with the uh, other astronauts on board the International Space Station. Uh, and uh, our day or the main part of our mission was to conduct a uh, scientific experiment uh, on the International Space Station. Uh, so Ryan and I, our role came to uh, safely uh, operate uh, the hardware on board the ISS and also uh, work closely with the uh, scientists on Earth to make sure we uh, have a safe and, and uh, we have a safe execution for the experiment and we can uh, relay the uh, data we had back down to Earth so they can analyze uh, what we uh, did. Uh, for the, uh, our time on board the ISS, we worked closely with the uh, crew on board, so we worked with the remaining crew from Expedition 68, uh, two cosmonauts and uh, Frank, and uh, also we worked closely with uh, Expedition 69, who made sure that we had the, the best of our time and, and to conduct safely and to understand and to utilize everything we had on board uh, the ISS. Uh, so I, I, I still remember the first experiment I had to do, which, is, uh, which was not included uh, in the training, uh, which is drinking a water bottle uh, in Dragon and trying to centrifuge the water to go to the other side so I can drink it. So everything in space, you, everything you do in space is an experiment. Preparing for sleep and sleeping is also an experiment that keep changing from night to night and then it's really interesting how the human body adapt and change uh, to microgravity and uh, just forget that uh, gravity exists and, and just live in space. Okay, thank you, Astrali. Um, uh, Mr. Ahmed al Khofeli, he's from the Saudi Space Agency and he kind of managed the human space flight and the outreach aspects. So just uh, two questions, uh, Ahmed. Uh, what is the rationale for the experiments that were flown uh, that you used? And then I'll come to the outreach aspects. Yeah. So, uh, so let me just give you a, a bit of a background for the, uh, for the program. When we first started the planning for the program almost two years ago, we had to set or articulate a set of strategic objectives for all the work stream. That includes the astronaut core, the training, the human capital, the infrastructure, and of course among them the scientific part, which is one of the most important parts of the program. So when you set a strategic objective, you have to know what kind of a baseline that you have. So uh, we did a quick baseline, and what we found out is we have a very enthusiastic RDI community in Saudi Arabia. Even when it comes to uh, a new emerging sector like space, we had uh, more than 18 satellites developed and launched, uh, payloads, uh, components, subcomponents. However, when it comes to microgravity research, which is what we're discussing now, let me say it wasn't as comparable 
in terms of the baseline that we had. So the first strategic objective to us was we had to build it. And therefore the main goal or a key word was, I want to reach out to this RDI segment. So we had to understand what does it contain. So we looked at it from two verticals. One is the ecosystem. We looked at, we have companies, we have small and medium enterprise, we have RDI institutes, we have hospitals, we have uh, even school. And, and, and therefore, uh, we had to cover all the aspects. So that was one thing that I had to reach out to them. In addition, I had to look at the scientific work stream, which is the themes that we have. We have physics, electromagnetics, we have human research, we have biomedicine, we have all kinds of science that could be involved within such a mission. So the best way was to do a quick open call where we reached out to uh, entities that had some research, but they were always faced with an obstacle. As they say, the most challenging part about space is basically reaching to space. And therefore, we had to facilitate that part that would include the integration capability with our partners, the execution of the experiments with our astronauts, and of course, as a research always need, it needs some kind of a subsidy to facilitate the uh, work. So we've done some kind of an open call, and then we received uh, quite a substantial number of uh, research. We had to assess based on these two work streams, but most importantly, the feasibility of achieving the, all the science that we received within a time frame because we had a time for the launch of the mission that we had to uh, consider uh, as well. And uh, here we are with 14 experiments in human research, biomedicine, uh, cell cells, and uh, a lot of educational research that we have done in physics and different kind of science. Thanks for that, Ahmed. And the, the second aspect, which is also very critical, is the um, outreach and awareness. And so maybe you just talk us through how you engage with the public, but also what was the impact of that engagement? Okay. Uh, outreach is really, uh, to me, is, uh, was an emotional, uh, the emotional part of the uh, project. Uh, uh, I remember that uh, for the outreach, we wanted to tackle students. We looked at different benchmarks, and uh, it was a good point to start uh, with the uh, youngsters that will be the future scientists and could be sitting just in this venue, maybe 10 years from now, speaking about their experiment. And I remember with my colleagues going to uh, the Ministry of Education, thinking that the success of that meeting is that I would get the Ministry of Education to commit to providing maybe hundreds of students. And uh, with my basic geography knowledge, I thought that uh, I want to, uh, to reach out to different areas. So uh, maybe three or four major cities, one in the north, the south, east, and west, and the center. And that would be a success and call it an outreach where we reached out to different entities. The good news is that uh, we went to the Ministry of Education and I think that would be a challenging discussion. However, it turned out they're asking me, why only hundreds, why only four cities? Why not thousands, why not just everywhere? And we get out of this meeting with the Ministry of Education committing to 12,000 students, more than 1,000. <laughs> there is even more to it. They even committed to, some people had to supervise the experiment with that kind of number of students. So they committed even to 1,000 teachers to supervise the experiments, also provide the location in 47 educational cities in Saudi Arabia, and even providing the venue, the feed that would log into the live feed that they have done it with the, uh, with the uh, astronauts. So that was, that was in a nutshell what we have done when it comes to the engagement with the Ministry of Education. And I think this is something that uh, put us under a lot of pressure to deliver with all the support that we got from the Minister of Education. Thanks, Ahmed. Uh, come back to Dr. Badr uh, Shira. Uh, so I know it's quite early days, but has there been any impact on the ex uh, from the experiment itself uh, in the profession? And maybe what's next uh, if there's a follow-up mission? Any plans for that? 
Yeah, this is a very interesting question. So the impact is huge from these experiments. Number one is uh, these experiments will show us the results or the effects of microgravity and radiation on the brain in, in a way that was not done before, which will constitute the scientific base on which future research is built, uh, which is very important. So this is one scientific impact that's very important. The other one is that these experiments encourage the scientific community in Saudi Arabia uh, to consider space as a research platform. I actually had many people reach out and want to conduct their research in space and say, how, how did you do it? You know? and, and what are the potential ways of doing research in space? And now we have a grant opportunity that is currently underway in the country, and many people are applying to conduct their research in space. So you can see that this ex these experiments had a significant impact reaching out to all the scientific community in Saudi Arabia. And I believe in the future, uh, you know, we will, uh, medical research is going to be highly needed, especially if we want to go to the moon, Mars, asteroids, and beyond. Uh, so uh, conducting this research and being involved in such research from the beginning is very important. Uh, what's next for us is actually many of the devices we flew for the first time uh, need to be flown again in longer duration missions because we've proven them to be successful. Uh, I cannot reveal too many results, but you know, the, the results are very impressive and uh, they, these devices have significant potential for many future research in space. Uh, and also the samples we got when integrated with samples from different astronauts over different durations and different missions, that will give us a better understanding of the effects of microgravity on uh, the human body. And uh, so, so this is one of the future directions. What's next is in sending these devices and collecting samples from future astronauts going to space in future missions over longer periods. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Kaur, um, so how will the results of your experiments essentially impact in your field? I mean, again, it's quite early, but it's obviously somehow advancing your existing knowledge um, so, so what's next? So I think uh, what next is, you know, in, uh, in research is interesting. Research, if you don't get, um, when you get uh, answers, one answer, you get also 10 more questions. It's always the case. So I think this will be driven by the results, yeah, what to do next, but definitely I would think uh, uh, long, long flights is, is the way to go, the longer duration, because this is happening over 10 days, you know, our, uh, our experiments. But we really need to, to know more about the longer flights, so that one thing. Uh, the other thing is, um, um, when we will know for the first time about the mRNA half-life, it's actually as calculated uh, in minutes, uh, between microgravity and, and, and Earth. It should give us uh, more highlights about, in general, um, our response to, to, to microgravity and, and the International Space St Station environment. Uh, it's very interesting to know that when, although we, I, I don't have the whole results, as I told you, it's gonna take up to, towards the end of the day to, to have the whole picture about the results. Uh, but I would like to say that if the mRNA half-life increased in general, I think you can set up biomanufacturing facilities up there. You can increase recombinant DNA technology, you can increase RNA vaccine production. This is all hypothetical, but the data should drive us towards that one. If it is the other way around, if the mRNA half-life is reduced in general, especially in filamentary uh, uh, in, uh, pro inflammatory uh, cytokines and, and, uh, and other growth factors, uh, you might be actually able to lessen some of the disease severity of certain chronic inflammatory conditions. That's also hypothetical. I was, uh, talked, I was talking to Bader, Dr. Bader um, on, on a dinner about, so if we knew that there will be lessening of inflammatory response, what you would do? You're gonna send patients up there to, to maybe improve, that's possibility. We will know about the response to therapy so that do they get, if they are improved or they are improving, you can send patients up there. But also possibility, although I'm not sure, I think some of the engineers can, can tell us, it depends if there's interaction with the audience. What about uh, microgravity chambers on Earth? 
Okay, that's supposed to be invested in because if you have health benefits, not uh, you know, um, people think that it might be all bad, you know, from a, from a health point of view. But who knows? You don't know if they respond better. If these are leukemic cells, and I can see, sir, their growth is actually listened, even from the data itself. So. This is all hypothetical, but it is, it is realistic. It is realistic. We should, we should go towards that. With, and this is only can be done with research and also in longer flights. So I, I hope I, I, I have answered this question. It's a tough question, but uh, to answer. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know we talked about this offline as well, because you've used the microgravity environment as your lab. But there's discussions around setting up habitats in the moon and even in Mars. The big difference is there's no magnetic field, uh, no radiation shielding. So the effects at the cellular level is going to be vastly different as well. So that research that you just started obviously needs to be expanded in that direction as well. Uh, Dr. Wijdan, um, did you find any unexpected uh, outcomes maybe before, during, and after uh, the mission itself? And, uh, yeah. uh, yes. There, uh, there were a few uh, uh, things that we went through during preparation of the experiment. Uh, communicating with the Saudi Space Agency, with Axiom, with the Bioserve. I had to make sure that we were all aligned on the same page, understanding. Uh, because for a researcher, it's very difficult. Um, it's one of the challenges that when you write an experimental proposal yourself, it's very difficult for someone else uh, to, to perform it. So I had to make sure that I provided a detailed protocol uh, for the astronaut to be trained on. So um, that was one of the things that we, we wanted to make sure of, that they receive uh, a detailed uh, steps about the experiment. Um, during the mission, the outbound, we were like monitoring Ali and Rayana while they were, Rayana while she was doing the experiment. Um, so, for example, two of the cell vials that we sent, they lost their cap. So we couldn't use them because we were afraid of contamination. So we had to compensate for that. Thank God that we, or we had backup vials uh, in, in, in the thing that we prepared, in the packages. Uh, making sure that they have, uh, uh, that everything is backed and labeled clearly for each experiment so they won't struggle during uh, the experiment looking for things, uh, for the vials or for the treatment. Um, what else? Uh, well, there were many. <laughs> of course, because it's a cell, yani it's a cell science, uh, so we, uh, the delay in the launch date, uh, forced us to stay in, uh, there in the state for so long until they launched because we had to prepare everything just before the mission for the treatment and the cells. They have to be prepared exactly before the mission. We cannot prepare them before and store them uh, to make sure that they are still viable and, uh, and active. Um, so, uh, and um, now when we receive the data, we're gonna see, we just wanted to make sure that there were not, there wasn't any technical issue that will interfere with our experiment, and so that the results that we are getting are due to biological changes, not due to anything uh, technical. Uh, so, uh, yes, that's... Okay. No, thank you, it. Dr. Wijdan. Um, Astro Ali, I'm gonna go actually off topic a little bit, and we discussed this. Um, I, I was at the, in Riyadh, when you were actually being, and uh, Astro Rayana were being launched, it was like 12.30 a.m. in the morning and there was a, a huge buzz. But the question I asked you, what was it like sitting on top of a Falcon 9 rocket and being shot into space? Well, I was really uh, excited. Uh, as you know, the certain thing about space missions change. Uh, so we are really, uh, we were worried about uh, if we are going to launch or not because the weather that day was not uh, favorable uh, to, to our mission. But luckily, we ended up launching into space. So the excitement was very high inside of uh, Dragon. We were cheering and, and, and shouting until uh, Piggy asked us to come down. Hey, guys, come down, please. I want to hear the communication and I think it was clearly uh, shown in the video how excited uh, we were uh, I mean uh, being inside the rocket launching to space if you uh, 
if you if you were to tell me that I'm gonna go to space like two years ago, I would say that's impossible. Uh, but uh, being there, and 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 uh, actually myself being a believer that there is there is nothing there there is not such a thing as impossible. Uh, but uh, the time we live in in Saudi Arabia, with the support we have from our government and our king and crown prince, and that they make sure that we have everything uh, we need to succeed as a country and to, to fight uh, for uh, technological uh, improvement. Uh, the Falcon 9 and the Dragon itself, it's uh, amazing. Uh, um, uh, equipment or, or uh, rockets that uh, you can see the booster comes back to land and 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 the dragon itself continues uh, to space I remember a funny story my mom told me as she was watching the launch she did not anticipate uh, she did not expect the huge sound that the the main booster are gonna make when it comes back to landing and uh, at some point uh, the footage inside Dragon uh, were not showing, and she was scared that maybe something bad has happened. And uh, she was crying, and I, I think everybody uh, was there also also was emotional uh, about the mission. That's amazing. Uh, Ahmed, you were responsible for the mission. Uh, you, you sometimes describe it as mission impossible because this is your first experience in terms of training the astronauts or overseeing that. How did you manage that this, uh, without any experience? Ahmed. No, Ahmed. Oh, what was the question again? <laughs> you were responsible for the training of the astronauts uh, without any prior experience. Uh, how did you manage that? It's, uh, it's really a simple, a simple, I would call it phenomena. I've read it uh, in, in multiple places. So uh, I read a phrase uh, about a couple of years ago where it says, uh, we didn't do it because it was easy, because we thought it was easy. And that was exactly the case when we started the project, I thought it was We'll do the selection, we'll end up with the astronaut, and then we have just autopilot project. But I thought it was as easy as that, but then it was full of challenges that uh, before doing it, we thought it was easy, and that was the motivation to solve it all, all along. And I wanna emphasize here on uh, all the support that we got from the international partners, uh, governmental entities, inside and outside the Saudi, that really facilitated a lot of the work that we have done and also facilitate expediting the lessons learned that uh, we got uh, through, the, uh, through the project. But the training of the astronaut and the astronaut that uh, we picked were extremely professional that uh, we didn't really have any struggle with it. Thanks, Ahmed. Um, can I also invite the audience? Uh, you can either raise your hands, but there's also the opportunity to go, to, go on Slido. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Pilar. And I see another hand up there as well. Uh, Dr. Val, thank you uh, for staying here and for share all this uh, beautiful experience. Congratulations to the space uh, agency and all team because really the history is amazing. And uh, as a vice president for emerging countries and, and development communities, I want to know how you think that you can share these uh, experiments, this uh, knowledge that now you are discovering in all uh, mission uh, between other countries that now we don't have uh, missions like uh, that you are doing now. How, how do you think that we can cooperate with uh, Latin America, Africa, and other regions and involve more the planet uh, in, in that class of mission. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that, Pilar. Uh, Ahmed, can I pass that on to you? That's, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, the STEM park on, on, uh, the STEM mark on, on space is that it's based on collaboration. The mission that we have done was based on lessons learned that we get from different entities, partner entities that we learned from on what is the most efficient point to do all our streams of the program without degrading the quality. That really helped us to do this mission in 
I would say a record time is before signing the contract to having two astronauts on board of the ISS was only 11 months, so that is less than uh, 12 months, which is really challenging when it comes to the human space of flight time frame. And that was really based on the lessons learned that we tried to avoid and enhance, and we're more than happy to even share the lessons learned that we have done to even share it with others that they could do it as fast as, as needed. And again, without degrading the, the equality, we're very open for collaboration. Space is a collaborative uh, atmosphere, and uh, we are a part of it. Okay, thank you. There's another hand up there. Uh, hello again. Um, actually, I'm very honored today I can give question to you. Uh, I have uh, two questions, actually. Uh, so, um, what's your most interesting observation or experiment in space? It's first one. And second one, um, um, how I can say, how, what, uh, what are the emotional uh, effects of being in space? Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for those questions. Uh, I would say my, my personal favorite experience uh, in space was the second hour we reached the International Space Station and as we were uh, moving cargo from, uh, and payloads from Dragon uh, to the ISS, uh, we were about to uh, fly over Saudi Arabia at night. And uh, I remember Sultan, he came and, and dragged me out of Dragon and he asked me to go to the cupola and just uh, enjoy watching uh, our kind of flying over our country and see it for the first time from space at night and you can uh, clearly recognize uh, the cities and, and, and we flew over uh, my city so uh, it was a very very nice moment uh, for me uh, and a good start for our mission and to answer your second question uh, I'm sorry can you repeat the second question yeah I can hear you good. What are emotional feelings in space? What are you feeling? Okay, so uh, usually in space, uh, we stay focused doing work and uh, we stay engaged and involved in doing a scientific experiment and other things. Uh, so the time I would say we think about our emotions is uh, uh, when we call our, our family. And uh, as a young father, I have uh, two years old daughter, I, I uh, really enjoy talking uh, to my wife and daughter at night and I uh, tell them how much I miss them and how space is actually fun to be here and I cannot wait for my daughter in the future to be an astronaut and visit. Thank you. I see another hand. Good morning, uh, I'm Nir from Israel. I wanted to ask you the forum, the distinguished forum, what do you think uh, about uh, civilian space missions? Will they be the most dominant in the future to come? Uh, more than what it used to be in the past years? Uh, mainly focusing on the uh, collaborations of medicine and all kinds of other science in order to advance the humanity in space? Will this will be the dominant uh, exploration of space for the years to come? I'm not sure I got the question, but I'm not sure. Ahmed, did you get it? I think I'm getting a lot of uh, echo in here, but my understanding is you're asking about the next mission and what ambition do we have when it comes to exploration and science? Was that the question? The question is mainly all over the years it usually was governments and space agencies and now we see more and more uh, missions that are uh, uh, dominant missions that civilian missions or, or from companies, from new space companies more than governments. How do you see the future to come regarding uh, space exploration and, and advancing in, in uh, uh, find how our body or how things are working microgravity while the emphasis is from the civilian or from the uh, private companies and not from government. Um, I'm still struggling with the... Uh, 
I think with the echo, but... Uh, it's a very bad echo from this side. Yeah. Yeah. But I think I will try to cover in, in a summary that I'm sure that it will cover what I capture from the question. So within the Saudi Space Agency, we have a strategy that is in the verge to be approved. So there will be a lot of announcements that are coming ahead. But let me try to announce what we can announce currently is we've started the first mission. And it's, as we announced exactly a year ago, it's a sustainable program that will have a diverse type of missions from a short stay to a long stay. In addition, we've already a signatory to the Artemis Accords, and therefore, it's not a secret that our ambition to go to the moon and even beyond that. That would require a lot of work when it comes to enhancing the capabilities of microgravity research, science in general, the human capabilities. It goes even into education and other capabilities that are related to space, and also activating the partnerships, not only within governmental agencies like space agencies around the globe, but in addition, there is one important sector that we even had to have to build, which is for the new space that is related to uh, entrepreneurship, small, medium, and, uh, and uh, enterprises, whether in Saudi Arabia or even internationally. And we've had the first cohort that we've launched, I think, uh, nine months ago that included entrepreneurs from Saudi Arabia and also from Saudi outside of Saudi Arabia. Just to emphasize on the, po uh, on the point that space is very collaborative and therefore we wanna, whoever could add to that exploration ambition, whether it is in a short, medium or long term, we wanna use that kind of a hand as, as a space doesn't know any boundaries. Thanks, brilliant answer, thank you. Are there any other questions from the floor? I see there's one hand here. Um, maybe while we walking down, uh, if you haven't visited the uh, exhibition booth, uh, I please encourage you to do that because there's a, the experiments, some of the experiments that were conducted in microgravity is actually exhibited on the stand as well. And you'll also get a little bit more information from that as well. Yeah, thank you so much for the interesting discussion. I just wanted to ask Dr. Badr, Dr. Khalid, and Dr. Bujdan, what's next for microgravity research or space science research in Saudi Arabia. Thank you. Dr. Badr, what's next? So uh, what's next, uh, as I said, this, these experiments lay the foundation for many future research uh, to be done in Saudi Arabia. So what's next is going to be many research uh, experiments flying from Saudi Arabia, sending samples for passive exposure to microgravity and then coming back. So this is one avenue that you will see a lot of in the future. Another thing is doing research on astronaut subjects, whether in very short duration low Earth orbit travels or short duration ISS missions or longer duration missions to the ISS. Uh, and then after that, uh, Saudi Arabia is now part of the Artemis Accord, so you may in the future see some of the Saudi science flying on the Artemis mission for cislunar um, uh, science. Uh, and all of this tells you that the future is, you'll, in the future you'll see a lot of scientific contributions coming from Saudi Arabia now that this mission achieved its objectives and inspired the scientific community in Saudi Arabia. Dr. Wijran, the same question to you as well. Uh, yes. Um, as a leading hospital, King Faisal was inspired by this mission and all the efforts from the Saudi Space Agency. Uh, so we are planning to open a section with Dr. Khalid Abu Khabar uh, for uh, space biomedicine research. So we can uh, invite researcher or do our uh, uh, research plan to be done or carried out in microgravity so we can understand more about the biology of uh, the molecular biology of what's happening to the astronaut how can we uh, assist uh, in uh, improving their health uh, in space finding more therapeutic targets that can also benefit astronauts also people on earth so, okay. thank you any other questions you want to Add yeah, this. I'm not, I'm not going to answer the question for two reasons, because they already have answered both. Yeah. Also, the person who actually asked the question is a friend of mine, and this is biased. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions from the floor? Uh, there's a hand. Oh, there's two hands. 
Thank you so much for the excellent discussion so far. So it's impressive to see the quick turnaround time um, from Saudi coming out as an emerging space station to carving out uh, a reputation of excellence and a place for itself in human spaceflight. So if you had to name, yes, absolutely, I deserve the applause. Congratulations. And I know we can't quite reveal the surprise of the Saudi strategy going forward. However, if you were to name three areas of excellence that you would like to carve a name out for yourself, it sounds like medicine, uh, medical research is one of them. Um, can you name three areas of excellence that 10 years from now you'd like to like, have Saudi associated with in human spaceflight? Ahmad, did you get that? It's really my location, so if you get that question, just. I might get it. I thought you asked about three areas of excellence that you wanted to touch up on. Maybe name three areas of excellence from the Saudi perspective. What is that? Related to this mission. The, Did I get it right? I could come closer, but okay. maybe it's within my location. Three areas of excellence for Saudi in human spaceflight uh, over the coming years. Did you get it? There's a really, really bad echo. <laughs> you you want to come up? So now I get the question. So the question was, what are the three areas of excellence when it comes to the Saudi Space Commission, now that the Saudi Space Agency for the next uh, a few years. Uh, if you noticed within uh, the speech that we've had and also the answers of my colleague, there is an inspiration and there is an ambition. This is why our new logo, if you just look at it, it's infinity. And uh, so areas of excellence, it couldn't be just only three. We have much more. We're trying to uh, be a main player within just the next 10 years when it comes to space. That what goes into downstream, upstream, as becoming an integral part of our life. A human space of flight is only supportive to all of that. Science is one thing. A human space flight, when it comes to the astronaut core, that we're also uh, trying to build. And also, one of the areas that uh, I think we've done an impressive job within the time frame is the efficiency when it comes to the selection of the astronaut. There are a lot of things that you could do that would take a few years. However, we could have done it in a few months without even degrading the quality. The time frame that we've had, I think, urges us to come to that area of excellence. So microgravity research is one of things. The astronaut selection is, is, is another thing. And also, uh, we're also trying to, uh, to be a major facilitator with the integration capability that we've built within, within this mission. I think there was one more question from this side. Alright, hello everybody, and uh, congratulations to you and the people behind you that make possible such successful experiments. And I'd like to address a question to the present astronaut here. So may you share one idea or one kind of experiment that you bring from up there to the scientists down on Earth? It was clear. Did you get the question? Can you repeat again the one echo, idea? The echo, the echo is a problematic. We can't hear really. So if, if you don't mind, yeah. Can answer it, okay. Yeah, go ahead, doctor. Yeah, so uh, basically, uh, he has a very interesting question, actually. He said, can you bring an idea from the experiments that were conducted uh, at the International Space Station to Earth? Did I say it right? Yeah, I think. Yes, I get it, I get it. Yes, yeah. I, I think I give an example when I was talking. Uh, if you see, for example, response to therapy in cancer is improved up there. Of course, you have to use a, a disease model or mice, for example, having tumor, we call it tumor-bearing mice, okay? 
if you see a reduction in a very specific type of cancer, not, not every cancer, because that's going to be really uh, exaggerated, but I do believe that there might be some kind of leukemic, uh, uh, leukemic type of, uh, of disease, leukemia, a specific type of leukemia, because remember they are under microgravity, they might be lessened, they might be respond better to therapy, for example, that's one possibility. So you go to Earth and you can apply this concept. Can we improve the response or chemotherapy uh, of, of cancer patients uh, towards uh, this goal? And, and you can do that again by, uh, you know, either having, uh, as you said, microgravity chambers, if it can be engineered, or, or maybe sending them up there. So that's, that's possibly a realistic idea, and it's going to be only happening with, with experiments. Uh, the other one is, for example, manufacturing of RNA vaccines. Are they going to be improved up there? Uh, how the RNA half-life is behaving? This can give more insights about what to do. I, I think there are so many examples that can, be, that can happen, in my opinion. So in uh, microgravity, um, studying the protein structure, protein crystallization, where you can identify therapeutic target will also help uh, here on Earth because you will study the protein structure so you will know how to make a target uh, therapy for this uh, kind of protein if it's uh, 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 responsible for any kind of disease like cancer, cardiovascular, or any other diseases. Thanks, Dr. Khabar and Dr. Wichdan. We've got 16 seconds left. Uh, so I just want to close out. Um, firstly, thank you for coming through and uh, for your interest in this particular mission. This was a very historic mission in many different respects for the Saudi Space Agency, and it's one of many uh, that's still to come. Uh, secondly, I also want to thank my panelists uh, in terms of sharing the experiments that you've done, the uh, um, the experiences, the emotions, and uh, also the outreach uh, as well. Um, so thank you. Uh, so I'd like to close off the session. Thank you.
Thank you for joining us today. My name is Zhu Linqi. It is my great honor to moderate the GNF China Space Citizen Benefits Global Space Exploration. This forum is organized by China Manned Space Agency and Chinese Society of Astronautics. First of all, may I briefly introduce to you our distinguished guests. Professor Yang Hong, China, Chief Designer of China Space Station, China Academy of Space Technology, CAST. Professor Zhang Qiao, Director Designer of China Space Station, CAST. Professor Lu Chongmin, Deputy Chief Designer of Space Utilization System of Manned Space Program, Chinese Academy of Science. Professor Nicholas Poudry, pro professor at University of Geneva, research scientist, and Mr. Wu Lei, producer and the senior space, uh, corresp uh, space correspondent of China Global Television Network. Welcome to all of you. The Chinese ancient people dreamed about Tiangong, meaning sky palace, for thousands of years. In 2022, construction of China's Tiangong space station has been successfully completed. The dream comes true. China Manned Space Agency prepared a video entitled, A Dream Comes True, Tiangong's Exploration of the Boundless, 
Let's watch the video.
全国一百多个科研院所、三千多个单位、数十万科技工作者，团结一心，按照党中央默画的宏伟蓝图，笃定前行，大力弘扬“两弹一星”精神和“载人航天”精神，以而今迈步从头越的自信与坚定。勇毅登攀，谱写了一曲曲社会主义大协作的时代凯歌。作为强国兴邦的战略工程，中国载人航天始终致力于服务民生、造福人类。四千余项技术成果广泛应用于国民经济各个行业。在生物材料、健康医学、农业安全、生态治理等领域发挥了重要作用，安排三千余项航天育种搭载实验，三百个育成品种通过审定，航天育种水稻、小麦大面积推广种植，显著提高了产量与品质。天工课堂等科普活动，激发了广大青少年崇尚科学、追求梦想的热情，极大增强了全国人民建设创新型国家的信念、信心，政治效益、经济效益、社会效益不断凸显。中国空间站不仅属于中国。也属于世界。本着和平利用、平等互利、共同发展的原则，与多个国家航天机构和国际组织开展合作，向世界开放中国空间站资源，启动实施十七个国际合作项目。未来，国外航天员也将进入中国空间站。中国航天员联合执行任务，随着工程进入空间站应用与发展和载人月球探测两大任务并行实施新阶段，必将为推动构建人类命运共同体做出更多中国贡献。探索、浩瀚宇宙，发展航天事业。建设航天强国，是我们不懈追求的航天梦。新时代，新征程，中国载人航天站在新的历史起点。中国人探索太空的脚步将迈更稳、更远。Thank you for watching. Now, please welcome Professor Yang Hong and uh, Professor Zhang Qiao, who will speak to us on frontier of space exploration, design, performance, and the future collaboration of China Space Station. Professor Yang Hong is chief designer of China Space Station of CAST, academician of Chinese Academy of Engineering, and the Academician of the International Academy of Astronautics, and a member of IAF Human Spaceflight Committee. Professor Zhang Qiao is direct designer of China Space Station of CAST. He participated in the system design and the development of China's space laboratory and the space station. First, welcome Professor Yang. Uh, thank you, Ms. Zhu. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Um, it's my pleasure to attend today's forum. First of all, um, please allow me to give a brief introduction to China Human Flight Program. In September 1992, China made a decision to implement the manned space program and prescribed 
the three-step development scheme. And uh, the first step is to launch the manned spaceship, set up the primary integrated experiment manned spacecraft engineering, and carry out the space experiment. The completion of the this step was marked by Shenzhou 5 spaceship mission in 2003. The second step, to make the technical breakthrough, such as EVA and space railroads and docking by manned spaceship and space laboratory Tiangong-1, uh, provide a solution for space application of the certain certain scale with the maintaining on a short-term basis. The completion this step was marked by Tiangong-2 Space Laboratory mission in 2017. The third step is to build space station and provide a solution for space operation of large scale with the maintaining on the long-term basis. China's space station consists of the three models, and the Tianhe co-model, Wentian experiment model, and the Mengtian experiment model in a T-shape configuration. <clears throat> the Tianhe co-model is the control and the management the center of space station and supplied the long-term residence of the astronauts. The main task of the Wintian experiment model is to serve as the backup the key platform function of the current model and provide the airlock for EVA. The Wintian experiment model has the ability for export payload go extra vehicular automatically. On April 29, 2022, 2021, the Tianhe Co model was successfully launched into orbit by Long March 5B rocket. As planned, by 11 launched and orbit mission, the the construction of China Space Station has been completed in the end of 2022 and started operation of the space station. So I'm pleased to introduce my teammate, Dr. Zhang. He will, uh, he will show the design, performance, and the future cooperation of the China Space Station. Now, welcome Dr. Zhang. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chu, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Professor Yang. It's my honor to thank you for this speech about China's space station, about its design, performance, and the future collaborations Okay. Today's introduction is showing four parts. First of all, mission goals of China Space Station. When we talk about the space station, we always review its history. The MIR, the world's first multi-module long-term space station was in broad shape, assembling orbit and gradually extended. And the ISS, the largest spacecraft ever built by the human being, composed of two main regions, the module parts and the trust part. The mission of China Space Station are as follows, operating reliably in orbit for a long time, providing guarantees for safety and astronauts to live healthily and work effectively, providing guarantees for the support of the multi-field scientific and technological experiment in space. The second part is system design of China Space Station. For overall, the lifespan is more than 15 years and even more, three crew members in the normal case and up to six for the crew rotation case. 
It has a configuration of block building with a local truss. Three modules in the same plane, large solar arrays of the experiment module arranging the both sides in two experiment modules with two degree freedom driving mechanisms for the highest power generation. The building process is through in space from the boat docking and the module transfer. As for the control and the, the propulsion system, computers, sensors, CMGs, thrusters in every module are connected with the data bus and integrated resource utilization. CMGs are the main modes. Both forward and backward docking mechanisms of car module equipped with the propellant refueling interface with the system. Cargo spaceship at the backward can provide the cross module propellant refueling system to Xuntian Space Telescope. The car module equipped with four horse thrusters with 80 meter newton and the specific impulse is 1600 seconds, which is slowing down the orbit decay rate. For energy, we use the standard 100 voltage system, large flexible solar rays. The length of solar rays in mountain and winter experiment modules are equals 27 meters. In information system, multi-layer network architecture is shown. The bus handles the key date and Ethernet handles high qualities of voice, images, and data, and data of the payload. The relay coverage rate is approach, uh, approximate to 100%. As for the environment systems, both the car module and the wind can experiment module equipped with regenerative high life support systems. Oxygen and waters are basically no longer depend on the ground support. So we have two robotic arms. Both of them are in 7 degree of freedom. They can work in independent or combined modes and walk or crawl on the space stations. The arms are used for the model transfer, EVA assistance, equipment corporations, exposed loading operations, capture within spacecraft, and even for the releasing small satellite. When the car module flies alone, the node is used as an airlock. After a Wintian experiment module coming, so we use we have the main airlock. And the equipment and exposed payload go outside through the cargo airship of the Mountain Experiment module automatically. Automatic docking mode is main for missing spacecraft. Manual tele, tele operation docking modes by astronaut is backup. The weight of the two experiment modules are about 23 tons, and we use the two step unfolding scheme of the solar rays. It's huge, so we have the two steps. In our phase, quick rendezvous and docking chancing, they dock with the 10 hot car module in 13 hours. Two experiment modules transfer from the forward hatch to the lateral bursting hatch in plain way by two joints plane transferring metamator. In this process, passive stabilization scheme based on gravity gradient is proposed. That is a cartoon and the unorbit un missions of the transfer stage. For experiment model, for experiment support system, the pressurized, the pressurized payload is made by rack form providing the mechanical power, communication, thermal, and the vacuum resources. For exposed payload by standard adapters or extended interfaces providing the mechanical power, communication, thermal, robotic arms resources. And the third part is technical performance and advanced nature. First of first, the top design of China Space Station is independence, innovation leading, system guarantee, modular skill, and leaving space for development. And the design concept can be concluded as one equals one plus M. Not only means the space station is designed systematically in the very beginning, but also means all of the modules follow the, follow the uniform princess, and the space station can management all of the visiting spacecraft. Service, and the three-layer management architectures about station, module, and subsystem is formed in the design and the development process. Although the total equipment is more than 6,000, yet nearly 80% are universal. The design, verification, and identification are conducted in the same time, making maturity improved. Then high proportion of new technology and intelligence including the brand new technologies, network technologies, gigabyte network, ethernet, smart home concept, autonomous health management, and so on. Also, 
the full three-dimensional digital development and operation mode, actually, China Space Station is operated in three space, in three space station levels. We call it the real space station is in orbit, and we have an electric space station in the ground for the ground test and co-flight, and we also have a digital space station. The digital space station is used for the pre-mission simulation production, co-flight during mission and post-mission status assessment. China space station is in moderate scale and excellent cost effectiveness ratio. For instance, it has a high power generation efficiency and a strong experiment support capability. We emphasize the human-oriented design for the safe and effective residence. The station is operated within efficient man-machine coordination mode, such as the console for the robotic arms. The astronaut can control the robotic arm in the, in the carbon, and uh, such as the maintenance tools, body limit, and auxiliary operation devices, and the draft design. Finally, I'm going to show the prospect and the future collaboration of the China Space Station. China always follows the principles as peaceful use, equality, mutual benefit, and common development. And in the new program of application and development, China will continue to adhere the concept of openness and sharing, and conduct more international cooperation and exchanges with the countries and regions in the whole world. And welcome astronauts from other countries around the world entering China space station to carry out experiments. The collaboration could be conducted in payload level, technical level, and even in module level. In scientific and technology experiments, many research has been carried out, such as human function and medical research, basic function research on the microgravity, space breeding and planting growth research, new energy research, and the space component and parts research. We suppose the cargo airlock in Mengtian experiment module could be fully used in the future. As for a payload workshop, satellite in orbit assembly, EVA equipment maintenance, even for the microgravity and the vacuum lab. I guess Professor Liu Chongming will introduce the advantages of the space lab more details in the next speech. So in orbit service field, we focus on the function as a space home port. On orbit facility constructions and developing the intelligent space robots. Also, China Space Station is very suitable for space education, very suitable and very friendship. We will continue technology upgrading issues in intelligence upgrade fields such as Ethernet, Wi Fi technology, robotic arm opera operation technology human-machine collaboration based on VR and AR, debris observation, perception, and warm systems, etc. In digital twin technology, continue to improve the precision of the digital model, promote the digital space station to keep approaching to the real space in the orbit, realize the conjunction evolution of the digital space station to the real space in, in orbit. And we're also developing the big data and AI technology to predict the status and the operation in orbit spacecraft, maybe promoting the development model of this whole space industry. For future expansion, the large payload interfaces are being reserved for future exposed large payload. Additionally, interfaces for later modules are reserved. We will build a 180 tons, six modules assembly in the future inflatable and deployable module, not only for the near-Earth spacecraft, but also use a preliminary verification for the future deep space operations, immigrants, or residents. All of the above points could be considered and achieved maybe in by the future collaborations. So at the end, China Space Station will operate in orbit for a long time, more than 15 years, and we are continue contributing China's strengths to human beings, space exploration and the development. That's all. Thank you very much for your listening and patience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Yang and Professor Zhang, for giving such a comprehensive presentation. It showed us a broad and clear picture about China's space station. Now, I will turn it over to Professor Liu Chongmin. His speech is Space Exploration, New Opportunities and Potential, China Space Station Science, Utilization and Cooperation. 
Professor Lu Chongming is Deputy Chief Designer of Space Utilization System of Manned Space Program, Chinese Academy of Science. He is responsible for the overall technical work for space utilization system. He also has engaged in more than 10 space science missions. Welcome. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor to be here to share my presentation with all of you. My speech consists of uh, three parts. Part one, introduction to CSS research facilities. As stated as a previous uh, speech, CSS consists of three modules. There are 40, uh, 40 experiment racks internal, 51 payload adapters, and uh, three payload attach points external. So, all facilities can divide it into five categories. Now let's give a brief, brief look at the, these facilities. In space life science area, there are ecology, ecology science experiment rack biotechnology experiment rack and the uh, space radiation biology is post the payload. In fundamental physics, in microgravity, we deployed two racks. One is a cold autumn experiment rack and a high res precision time frequency rack. In material science, there are okay, sorry, continuous material experiment, material furnace experiment rack, and uh, material science exposed payload. Uh, in microgravity, fluid physics, and the combustion, there are fluid physics experiment rack two-phase system experiment rack and the combustion uh, experiment rack. In also, uh, also, we have developed uh, uh, some multiple purpose experiment rack, include a high microgravity level rack, varying gravity experiment rack, science globe box uh, refrigerator rack and the uh, online maintenance and the adjustment operator operation rack. Uh, in order to uh, support uh, these facilities operations and uh, carrying out uh, scientific uh, research and re experiments, uh, ground uh, operation and uh, controls networking are established. Its, uh, per uh, its function includes uh, a mission analysis and the simula simulation assessment, monitoring and the control, especially the payload operation and the application center is the post for scientists to carry out uh, the scientific experiment and uh, do uh, res deeply research. Uh, part two is CSS research and utilization progress. We also uh, established uh, five um, main objectives of CSS. They are scientific frontier exploration and research, new technology development and demonstration, social, economic, and benefits, science popularization and education, and the international cooperation. Our research and experiments uh, focus on four 
main re, uh, areas include uh, uh, certain research topics and uh, more than 16 research plans. The research area include space life science and human research, microgravity physics, space astronomy and earth science, and uh, space new technology and uh, utilization. Uh, now uh, here are some experiments that can that have been done on board the uh, CSS. Uh, in the space life science area, the left uh, the left uh, picture is uh, the research on the molecular me mechanism of fluorine re regulation in plants on the microgravity. We conducted the whole life cycle of rice from seed to seed, completed in space. And the regenerative rice was success successfully obtained. Uh, the right uh, picture is uh, the fluorescence image of induction process of the skeletal muscle cells. Uh, in material science, uh, we have conducted, uh, oh, sorry, conducted the uh, so, uh, dynamic me mechanism of a rapid uh, encouraging growth of uh, alloy was discovered. On the right, we conducted a combustion experiment. You can see the, uh, the picture we obtained from the CSS. The unsteady and uh, extinguishing behavior of the flame was uh, observed in gravity. Next, uh, uh, the left uh, research is uh, on vibration and flow characteristic of granular materials in varying gravity conditions, include uh, uh, Mars gravity, Moon gravity, and uh, uh, microgravity. Uh, the red picture is the result of a synchronous extinction of three uh, bubbles. Uh, is, uh, the experiment uh, uh, is uh, focused on heat transfer and the uh, bubble thermodynamics behavior in pool, uh, in pool boiling. Uh, in space astronomy area, uh, China space uh, Station telescope is uh, being developed, uh, which will conduct optical survey and uh, cosmological and uh, celestial research, and uh, it will be uh, be launched in near future. So uh, let's take a break, uh, quick uh, brief uh, brief of. Uh, experiment that have been done. Uh, more than 113 scientific research uh, projects were initiated, and uh, 65 of which have been implemented. 48 projects are ongoing. The third part is about inter international cooperation. Uh, we have established uh, international uh, cooperation networking, uh, including more than 10 international organizations, such as uh, United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs, IF, and uh, ESA. So about uh, the cooperation with uh, uh, UNOSA, First round of the CMS and the UN OSA cooperation selected seven projects from 17 countries to be conducted in the China Space Station. So about the cooperation with ESA, 10 ongoing cooperative projects for the first round, 158 lives from 195 Organizations of 23 countries are involved in the cooperation. Finally, 
we welcome to the international partners to join CSS mission in the way of cooperative research or joint payload development to benefit the science community and the industries and to promote the peaceful use of outer space. That's all. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Professor Liu. Uh, we learn more about China's space station uh, research facilities, research project progress, and international cooperation. Uh, China will carry out collaboration in experiments on China's space station. One of them is Polar 2 mission. Now we will hear from Professor Nicholas Poudry. He will talk about this mission. Professor Poudry is a research scientist, professor at the University of Geneva. He is mission manager of Polar and the technical manager of Polar 2. Welcome. Thanks, Mr. Zhu. It's a pleasure for me to, to speak here. So I will speak to you about a very successful collaboration uh, I had with China. So my goal uh, since several years now is to understand if the prompt gamma ray from uh, gamma ray burst are polarized. Uh, this is a very important uh, scientific subject because gamma ray bursts are linked with uh, uh, the, bur the birth of black holes and um, we, we don't have a lot of information from th those events and polarization is one of them. Um, how to measure that? Uh, measuring gamma ray polarization is much more difficult than optical uh, gamma ray where you can just optical uh, light when you can just use a filter. Uh, you have to rely on the Compton uh, process and you have to have that you, um, the photon do two interaction in your detector and then the direction of this uh, two interaction is a proxy for the polarization. So the, the detector uh, can be uh, thought like that. We, you have a multi-anode PMT and scintillator bars and you pack many of them and uh, a lot of electronic and uh, you can do this experiment. So uh, we, we built the Polar Collaboration. That was a collaboration between Switzerland, China, and Poland. And uh, we submit that to, to China. And uh, on 15 September 2016, it was sent in space together with the Tiangong-2 space lab. Uh, so the, the launch got some, uh, a lot of press coverage. Uh, and we had fantastic results during this uh, mission. And uh, the results were not at all what people were expecting. So now we see that this is a very difficult subject and we need a much bigger detector to, to really understand what is going on. So we, we start thinking about the, the next generation of those detectors. Uh, oh, and we were able also to measure the, the crab polarization, which was not a goal of this mission, but uh, I was very good surprised that we, we can do that. And we even demonstrated uh, uh, pulsar navigation in space. Um, so when UNOSA uh, made uh, a call for proposal to, to put things on the Chinese space station, we answered this proposal proposing uh, a much bigger uh, version of Polar, which we call Polar 2. And we were accepted. This is the letter of acceptation. And we built a new collaboration between uh, Switzerland, Germany, Poland, and China. So you see, it's, it's not a very big uh, collaboration. It's something you know, we can do with manageable number of people. Uh, this is what it will look. The technology is very almost the same than, uh, than with Polar. We replace uh, uh, multi-anode uh, PMT by uh, silicon PMT. We had to do a lot of R&D because si silicon PMT are very difficult in space. They degrade very rapidly with uh, 
radiation. So we, we had to do some uh, some further uh, study, and this, this is what it looks. So you see in, in green was polar, and if you scale it by four, because polar two is four times bigger, so, uh, and the, the new sil uh, silicon PM technology enable us to extend the energy coverage to, to very low energy, and with that, now we'll have a, a, something which is 10 times more uh, powerful than, than polar. Uh, we are also studying in some addition to HPD, they are not yet accepted. Uh, one is to extend the, the polarization to, to low energy with this LPD, and also to do image and, uh, and measure the, the energy of, of photon with another module. So, um, so when it will be done in space, we will be on uh, Wensian modules and this this will look you know this is a artist impression of how it will look and my conclusion is that we are preparing for launch in uh, 2025 uh, when we will be in space polar 2 will be the most sensitive grb detector ever in space you know almost every space uh, agency has, has sent the grb detector in space so there is a, a big international interest in GRB uh, science. Okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Professor Podry, for addressing this Polar 2 uh, collaboration project. We are looking forward to its implementation. Last but not least, Allow me to welcome Mr. Wu Lei. He will share his experience on how to boost communication of China manned missions from the media perspective. Mr. Wu Lei is producer and senior space correspondent of China Global Television Network. He has more than one million followers on social media such as Facebook and Twitter. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Ms. Zulinqi, and especially thanks for China Man Space Agency as well as the China Society of Astronautics for giving me this chance to share with you uh, some perspective, different perspective from uh, very previous uh, guests and uh, professors. Uh, we know that uh, Dr. Yang Hong and Dr. Zhang Chao and also uh, Professor Liu and uh, Nicholas shared uh, some technical experiments and also the construction of the China Man Space Station. And I would like to share something different about uh, China Man Space Agency, uh, China Man uh, missions from the media perspectives on the global communication uh, theme of this uh, huge project. And uh, it's my great honor to be here. And my name is Wu Lei, and I'm uh, from uh, China Global Television Network. And uh, Oh, sorry. Uh, this is uh, okay. Uh, as uh, well, China Man uh, missions have been uh, developing for several decades, and a lot of uh, uh, global space agencies, as well as global space fans, have uh, attached great importance to the latest development of China Man space uh, missions. And uh, I have uh, shared these uh, latest development on global social media platforms over the past uh, two years. And uh, I have over one million followers. And I can say that uh, most of the space fans have uh, attached a great importance. They, uh, they want to know more about what is happening on China man missions. And whenever I go to the launch site in Zhouquan Satellite Launch Center, I share the latest uh, development of China manned missions. And they have so many uh, positive feedbacks about the uh, Chinese astronauts or technonauts and what is happening on the uh, scientific experiments on board China Space Station. And I want to share that today I have uh, four uh, aspects. Uh, the first is uh, the most popular social media posts on manned missions, and secondly is uh, creativity and uh, scientific communications about the manned missions. And third one is how to improve the interaction with the global youngsters. 
as well as the multimedia communications and media collaborations. And firstly, I want to share some of the examples that I made on my social media platform. And we can see that some of the most popular uh, posts on my missions about this, this one is uh, uh, Chinese uh, astronaut and technologist Wang Yaping. Uh, she was uh, staying in the uh, China Tiangong Space Station. And this post is a briefly introduction about the mission on board China's Tiangong Station and over 1 million, uh, 1.7 million uh, 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 social media feedback on, uh, on that. And uh, a lot of uh, space fans want to know that their life, their experiment, and also uh, some daily experiment on board the China Space Station. And also this one is about the Chinese uh, technology uh, uh, this one is about uh, Jai Zhigong, Chinese technologist Jai Zhigong. Uh, he uh, has been staying on board the, the, about the Shenzhou 13 crew, and uh, he's been staying in orbit for a long time, over 100 times a new record high for the Chinese astronauts. And a lot of, uh, they have made several space walks, and a lot of sp space fans want to know about their space walks and also how to make that uh, exciting experiment on board China Space Station. And also, uh, they have uh, performed some traditional uh, you know, mu uh, musical experiments, uh, musical instrument on board the China Space Station, uh, bridging distances between the technonauts. And we can see a very beautiful view here uh, from the China Space Station. And a lot of uh, space, uh, global space fans, and they have uh, left their comments. They really want to know more about the uh, Taconaut's life and experiments. And they also uh, have a great expectation about what is happening in the future, because we know uh, that previously we have announced that global astronauts and also scientists and engineers are welcome to work and live on board China Space Station. And secondly, is about the creative and scientific communications. And I've made a very short and uh, interesting tour to China Space Station last year. And that is Tiangong in orbit, a seven minute uh, video and shot creative video uh, aboard uh, China Space Station. Of course, we couldn't uh, go to China Space Station right now, but uh, with some creative uh, uh, you know, technologies and shooting skills, we can uh, enjoy the and uh, show our global audiences about what is happening on board China Space Station. Starting with the launch of the Tianhe Core module in April 2021, China has planned 11 missions to complete the construction of the space station. So at this size and having floated through space for so long, how is the Tiangong maintaining power? Take a look inside the space station now. On China Space Station, technonauts can now use a mobile app to control the lights. Just like this. There are over 120 kinds of food here, so technonauts will have a different menu every day. Now let's take a closer look at the lab modules. The Wenjian Lab is mainly for the scientific research of life in space, including the growth and development of different types of plants, animals. Here is a key experimental cabinet called Universal Biological Cultivation Module, where the rice and Arabic doses are planted. So this is a very short video about uh, the Tiangong uh, in orbit. Uh, that is uh, what we have done uh, uh, in 2022. And also we have covered the whole story, not only astronauts, but also uh, the other teams, including the uh, rocket system, and also uh, uh, what is happening in the Dongfeng landing site, those uh, engineers who have welcomed back the astronauts.
That's a family reunion, uh, a reunion photo in the onboard the China Space Station of the Shenzhou different crew, because we know every year there will be two uh, rotations aboard the China Space Station. Uh, six uh, technos in total will be leaving for a while for the rotation. And third one is how to improve the interaction with global youngsters. We know uh, the uh, China uh, Space Station will be in orbit for a long time, uh, more than 10 years. And now Tiangong Class is a brand for the space education. We know the Shenzhou 13 crew and also Shenzhou 14 crew, Shenzhou 16 crew, they have conducted three uh, space classes uh, with global uh, youngsters, uh, not only American, but also African teenagers, and also with different countries aboard uh, with these uh, space classes. They have shown very interesting experiments in that microgravity environment. We have showed them what is uh, in the experiment, compared with them, and talked to the students, and also show them what is uh, especially to uh, plant the seeds of the space dreams in that uh, youngsters. And we can see this is a Shenzhou 16 crew uh, making experiments and uh, interact with students in China uh, in last month. And also multi-channel communications. Whenever today we are talking about the space research, and we know it's very important for scientists, engineers to conduct the jointly, uh, you know, projects. But also, it's also critically important to communicate with the world what is happening on board China Space Station. So we have used multi channels to communicate with our global space agencies, with our global space fans. We have using the live streaming channels and also we can use uh, you know, interviews. We have talked with different astronauts, talked with uh, experts, talked with youngsters, space agency leaders. We've talked to many, uh, made very interesting talk shows and programs to let us know uh, more uh, stories about the China Space Station. And also, uh, the last part is about uh, media collaboration. We know uh, today uh, we, we are not collaborating in, in uh, space agencies, but also uh, in the aspect of media. Uh, for, for example, we have uh, worked with RT and also with Poland TVN24 and also Nigerian TV station on the China Man Space Station because the global audiences want to know more about China Space Station. And as a media, we have a very good relation with uh, global media outlets. And also, it's very interesting to talk with different media outlets and to let us know what is uh, really the out output and the aspiration about the China Man Space Station. And especially this time at the IEC. And actually, yesterday, uh, we, uh, CGTN, had a, uh, co produced a special program with Azerbaijan National Television Network, ASTV. Uh, we have invited several uh, high level guests, and we talked about the topic of space for all, creativity and collaboration. And this is a very interesting topic, and we will air that uh, spe uh, special program tomorrow, and us TV already uh, aired that on their television network. So that's all. Thank you very much for, uh, for the media collaboration, and we're looking forward to more collaboration in the future about the China Man Space Station. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Wu. Uh, China Space Station is open to the whole world. We believe that the world will have a better understanding of China Space Station through more collaboration and communication. Let us give our warm applause to thank the speakers again. <laughs> Next, I will invite them to come to the stage to join our panel discussion, please.
So we were kind of running off time. So here is a question for all of our guests. From your perspective, what insights would you like to share about space cooperation? Professor Yang Hong, would you please share your insight first? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And China's space station followed the pin principle of the peace use uh, and the equality, material benefits, and common development in the future. And, and the China space, uh, China space station will continue to adhere the development concept. It's the openness and the sharing and conducted the more international cooperation with the, with the countries and the region. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Professor Liu, would you please share your opinion? Uh, so uh, uh, there's no end to uh, space uh, exploration. Uh, so is uh, space science and and uh, utilization. Uh, we per expect to jointly propose a scientific research plan and uh, jointly uh, develop uh, some specific uh, payloads in front in cutting edge uh, areas. Uh, so as to uh, build uh, the long-term sustainable and uh, bilateral or multilateral cooperations. Thank you. Thank you. So Professor Pojoy, would you like to share with us? So in, in science, we expect collaboration, and I have to say that my experience with China was very positive. People are, have goodwill, and I'm sure it could be improved, for sure, but uh, I'm sure it, it will improve still. Thank you. So, Professor Zhang? From my opinion, uh, I talk about the, from the operations in the technology field. So, as we know, the debris in the field, in the un university and the orbit is very awesome. It's not very good and it's terrible. So we can uh, make the corporations on the debris protect. But first, we should make the assessment. Assessment protect and maybe some defend of it. And the other is we can do more the new uh, for the life support systems. Life support systems. Now we can we use the biologies, and the biology is a nice choice for it, and we upgrade the upgrade the technologies. Another is about uh, space robot. Yes, as we know, the space robot is from the intelligence field is very quite familiar in the future, and we should do many works on it in the collaborations with others international field. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. So, Mr. Wu. Okay, we know that uh, China Space Station is a national space lab, and now besides the International Space Station, uh, China Space Station is a new platform. It's open to global society, and I believe that uh, it is open to the whole world. All astronauts, scientists, engineers can work and live aboard China Space Station. It's a new opportunity. And I hope that one day, uh, ordinary people will have the chance to go there, and even our, including our journalists. I think if we have the chance to go there, that would be great. I would love to go there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that was a great discussion. Thank you all for sharing your experience and insights. Uh, at the beginning ceremony of IAC, blessings were sent from China Space Station. Technos told a touching story about Baku hosting IAC. It also reflects that space exploration requires continuous efforts from generation to generation. It also needs uh, uh, extensive international cooperation. China will continue to build China's space station into a shared home for all mankind. 
China Space Station belongs not only to China, but also to the whole world. I would like to close this forum by thanking all of your participation. Thank you all, and good day. Thank you.